Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Tuesday, September 28th meeting of the Board of Supervisors. It's just a couple seconds after 9 a.m., and we'll get started. We'll start with our flag salute, and uh, Ms. Schwab will lead our pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, with that, we will move to our consent agenda. Um, I know we've had a request to uh, remove item 18A by Supervisor Jones, and I believe staff has another item. Yes, um, uh, Commissioners, would I, or Supervisor, I'd love to uh, request that we uh, take 14A and move that to a later date and pull that off the consent item. Okay. Are there any other items from other board members that you'd like moved? I am not. Uh, no. Okay. Any members of the public would like any items removed from the consent calendar agenda? I see none, Chair. I'm not seeing any. We did have a written comment with somebody asking us to remove some, but if they're not here to ask for that, then we just leave it. Okay, thanks for the correction. Uh, then can I have a motion to approve the remaining items on consent calendar? I'll second. And roll call. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Okay, then we'll move to item 14A. And we just uh, request just a continuance to a later date and we'll be bringing that forward to you at a later time. Okay, great. Any questions? Any public comment? Okay. We'll need a motion to continue that item. Thank you, Karen. I'll move that. We continue. We just need a motion to pull the item off the consent. Pull it off the agenda. Okay. I move to pull the item off the agenda. And I'll second. Thank you. And is this a roll call? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And then we'll move to item 18A. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, I'm sorry, Madam Vice Chair. Chair for today. And supervisors, my name is Kate Sampson with your Human Resources Department. The item before you is the standard adoption of ordinances introduced by your board at its prior meeting on September 14th, 2021. The ordinances implement compensation terms for the Deputy Sheriff Association, including pay raises and increases to special incentive pays. If adopted, the ordinances will be effective the next full pay period, which begins October 9th. Also proposed for your consideration are amended resolutions addressing pension contributions to CalPERS. As a reminder, your board approved these resolutions at its last meeting in order for legacy employees to pay a greater portion of their own fair share contribution to retirement costs. The edits proposed today are addressing clerical errors in the dates to align with the October 9th effective date of the ordinances. Since the intent of the board, as staff understands it, is for the entire compensation package to be implemented at one time, I am requesting your consideration of the proposed amendments to avoid any employees experiencing increased costs without the benefit of offsetting raises. I'm certainly available for any questions. Thank you, Kate. Are there any questions? Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Kate. Uh, any public comment on this item? Good morning, Supervisors. Uh, Rich Cervantes of the Deputy Sheriff's Association. Um, the reason I came here today is to have you guys strongly can reconsider uh, moving forward with this contract. Um, the point of contention mostly was Measure F. And last time I was here, I read an article from 2003 by the county CEO. And today I wanted to read what was placed on the ballot 2006 for Measure A. This went out to the voters 
in 2006. In November of 1976, the voters of Placer County approved an initiative that adopted an ordinance into the Placer County Code. This ordinance requires Placer County Sheriff's Department sworn law enforcement officer salaries be fixed at the level of sal average salaries of comparable positions in Nevada, El Dorado, and Sacramento counties. This ordinance is codified as Placer County Code Section 31240 Salaries Placer County Sheriff's Ordinance Initiative. Since this ordinance was enacted by the voters of Placer County, only a majority vote by Placer County voters voting on this measure can repeal the ordinance. If repealed, salary levels for sworn law enforcement employees in the Placer County Sheriff's Department would be established in the same manner as other county employees through periodic negotiation between the Placer County Board of Supervisors and the representatives for sworn law enforcement employees of the Sheriff's Department. A yes vote on this Measure A would repeal the existing ordinance and enable the Board of Supervisors and Placer County Sheriff's sworn personnel to negotiate compensation in the same manner as other county employees. A no vote on this measure is a vote to retain the existing ordinance, and that was by Anthony J. LaBeouf, County Council, and also Sabrina M. Thompson, Deputy County Council. And the resolution was approved by both Supervisors Wygant and Holmes in 2006. Um, there's a few other things that we've noticed with this contract. There's, there are some flaws with it, and giving us more time and to be able to go back to the negotiating table, we can fix those flaws. Um, the biggest one that we've noticed was the field train officer pay. Um, it's a capped pay rather than a percentage. And it also caps how many uh, field training officers would be eligible for the pay for the month. That number is half of what we have right now. It caps at 12. We currently have 25 training officers between field and jail. It also doesn't address how uh, working overtime with a trainee would, would operate as well. So there needs to be language that clears that up. And again, if we can go back to the negotiating table, we can raise the concerns and address the concerns of fiscal unsustainability while also being able to get a contract that makes sense where we can still recruit and retain quality deputies. Anyone else from the public like to comment on this item? And if there's others, please line up. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer. Um, I was here the last week or two weeks ago, and I feel like you guys should really consider not going forward with your decision that was made. It seemed like both sides had very valid points about confusion of how the graphs came about that you guys are determining the pay for. So I think it would be in everyone's best interest to meet and not move forward at this time. We live in a world of uncertainty right now, and I would really like to know we have our sheriffs for us if we have an emergency. I am very disappointed to hear that we're gonna be cutting back what we would have in our county to keep us safe and to keep each sheriff safe because there won't be enough people to respond to help them. So I'd really, really appreciate if you would take a second and think the voters really wanted Measure F. They voted for it three times. And to go ahead and meet with both sides, work out what the health insurance is that you guys are using, um, all the stats so they're agreeable to come to a graph that could actually be used instead of saying he said, she said, because that's a little bit not good, okay? We're like kind of past middle school, high school. We're adults here and we should sit down and really look at what's happening here. Our safety is at risk. Your safety is at risk. My safety is at risk. And the voters have said, we want this measure. It was also brought to the attention that we were really close to making a deal and no side could figure out 
why it didn't go through. And I think until you really explore that, I don't think moving forward and throwing it all away to just do something else makes any sense. Especially if a lawsuit can come to the county, that's gonna cost more money in the long run. Thank you. Good morning, my, my name is Michael. It's um, troubling that the board would usurp the will of the people and um, recall Major F. Um, I think you're setting a, a very poor precedence by doing that. You're not honoring, you're just doing what you think maybe is best and ignoring the will of the people. And um, I think that will reflect poorly on you in the future, and especially with future elections. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Jason Wedge. Um, I wasn't going to speak on this. Uh, so just running through my mind, I was here last week when this was going on, and, um, and uh, the rhetoric that I'm getting talking to, you know, a lot of people, you know, your constituents is that it's pretty consistent throughout the board is that your constituents feel that their constitutional rights was violated last week. And one of the big concerns that um, keeps coming up is that if you can do this, what else can you do? So moving forward, um, I would be very, very careful of what you guys decide and I would really God's given us two ears and one mouth and that simply means we need to hear more than what we speak so I would listen to your constituents because right now they're not too pleased of the decision that was made um, regardless you know at the you know how it was based um, you know and being here last week and I actually ran through the tape again a few times and pretty much a majority, if not everybody, was in favor of what you guys opposed. And so um, I would consider that moving forward is to listen to us. You know, we're the ones that put you guys there. You know, bottom line is you guys do work for us. You know, um, you know I say that, um, you know, in a, in a, not to intimidate you, but, um, you know, we put you there because we trust in you to uh, to do your job and to represent us and to represent, you know, our sheriffs, which we saw last week. And so, um, so I just want to say just uh, what the people are saying. Um, I would listen to your constituents because that is the majority. What they're feeling right now is they feel that their rights are being stripped. We're seeing that on a higher government level, our rights being stripped. And now they're starting to feel that from a local level. And that is not a good spot to be in. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisor Sue Franklin from Roseville. Um, I was here two weeks ago, but I left before the vote. But I did hear, and thank you, Suzanne Jones. I heard you were the only one that stood up um, for the sheriffs. Um, it's really disheartening because you are there seated there and representing us because we voted you in so your constituents you're really working for us and you need to listen to the people um, like one of the speakers said this world is crazy right now and who's got our back the sheriffs they're out there putting their lives on the line every day. Every time they put on a uniform, they are there to protect us. And we're just asking that they have the pay that they really deserve. I mean, <laughs> when you're putting your life on the line for people, and, and some people may be even bad and they have to go in and help them, and you're saying they don't deserve a pay raise that's equal to different counties around us it's just kind of um i can't even down in my heart know where where it's coming from that you vote no or that you don't say let's put this off and work with the sheriffs 
to make sure that they um, get what they deserve. Um, they, I just, I have so much um, respect for our police officers, our sheriffs, anyone that um, is there to protect all of us. So um, as a constituent, um, I, just, I just hope that you can reconsider and um, dig deep and find a solution for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And how many more do we have to speak here? We have one on Zoom as well. Are you the last? OK, great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so my questions are uh, COVID related. I'm Jacqueline from Newcastle. This is an item on 18A. Oh, 18A. So we're not on public comment yet. We'll, be, we'll come to public comment in just a minute. So anyone else speaking on item 18A? We have one caller on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Nettie, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, thank you for having me. I'm calling in in regards to um, Measure F. And I'm speaking to the public here just to let everybody know that um, Mastagny Law had put out a statement on Gold Country Media stating that they were going to have to do another round of litigation on behalf of the voters under the election law. And I would, it would be safe to say that the uh, Board of Supervisors is not listening to their constituents. So I would behoove everybody to contact Mastagny, <clears throat> excuse me, and support them in that litigation effort. And um, you can do that by filing affidavits in support. And you can also do that by contacting them and asking them to file that litigation um, as the voters are being silenced, their First Amendment right is being silenced. And, um, you know, the Constitution is written in plain English, so I'm not sure why um, Ms. Schwab feels the need to uh, interpret it. But I would just like to, to, you know, just reach out to the public and let everybody know that it would probably be best to contact Ms. Stagney Law and help them in their efforts in regards to the litigation in Measure F. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chair, hey. I see no further comments. Thank you. So we'll close public comment on this item. Um, Kate, there was uh, some comments made by Mr. Cervantes. Did you want to address those on the, um, the additional, uh, the flaws in the contract? I'd be happy to. Um, what I heard Mr. Cervantes note was a cap on field training officers at 12. That cap is in the existing contract that was uh, approved by the board and the DSA in 2015. So there's no change to the cap on the number of officers. And the amount approved by your board is equivalent to the 5% uh, at a, the level of a step five for deputy sheriff two at the time in December 2020 when the offer was made. Um, so beyond that, I would say, um, as discussed by your board, the county is certainly open to returning to the table to uh, discuss the next contract for the DSA, and we'd be happy to consider any proposals surrounding this issue at that time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Okay. Board members, any comments, questions? Uh, just to clarify, um, so the action that we're taking with this change in the contract, we are not reducing the number of deputies that are serving our public. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And in this contract, um, we're actually in giving a 4% increase this year, 4 and a quarter next year, and 4.5% increase in the third year of the contract, correct? Supervisor Gore, that is the content of the county's proposal to the DSA. What your board approved last week was the first year of that proposal. Uh, your board um, invites the DSA to return to the table to consider future years. So we'd like to provide that opportunity. Um, but at this time, yes, the action proposed today would confirm a pay raise for the Deputy Sheriff's Association, as well as increases to other elements of compensation. It is not a pay cut. Thank you. Um, and, and I absolutely agree. I, I really, first I want to say thank you for those who came up and were really thoughtful um, in your conversation and the way you approached us as a having a nice civil discourse. I really do appreciate that. So thank you um, very much. And, you know, I certainly understand the concerns that you all raised. 
Um, our board has been negotiating for two and a half years with um, the deputy sheriff's union, and that has been obviously a, a, it's been a challenge because we it took this long to get to a place um, where we felt like we needed to take this action. Um, we aren't cutting deputy pay where they deserve. Um, good salaries, absolutely, which is why our board said we want to give more money, because currently they're making 18 to 23% higher than the deputies in the other surrounding areas. Um, so our deputies are well paid and we have wonderful deputy sheriffs, absolutely. Um, this has been a challenge, but at the end of the day, you're right, we are elected by you and our job is a very large job, which is to overall look at the needs of this community which is absolutely public protection, as well as everything else in this $1 billion contract, which means parks and roads and libraries um, and all the other things that our residents here in Placer County expect. And if we cannot um, get a handle on future increases, uh, we won't have the dollars available to make sure we can pay the OPEB and all the other expenses um, for our community. So this is a really, really challenging decision for me. Um, and I wish we could have gotten to an agreement with the union. I really wish we did, but we couldn't. And it was really clear that we were unable to do that. I think this is the best decision. Our board ultimately has the, the responsibility to take care of the budget in our county, as well as we have the discretion on salaries for the entire, um, all of the employees here in Placer County. So I am ready to move forward um, as we voted on last um, last board meeting. And with that, I'll move approval of the item. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Did you want to make any comments? Just want to make the comment, yeah. That <clears throat> for all the reasons stated at the last board meeting about Measure F and the, and the uh, charter superseding Measure F, I still do not agree that <clears throat> legally the uh, the charter superseded Measure F in such a way because Measure F was voted on by the voters. And so <clears throat> I will not be supporting these items today. Thank you, Supervisor Jones. Any other comments, Mr. Holmes? Um, I, I wanted to make one uh, final comment too. And, and I think the confusion, and as was read earlier, is that Measure F the language of it was clear. The voters' intent was that we would pay the average salary. I think what's confusing to many in the public is that our total compensation is not regulated by that, and that's where we're at 18 to 20 percent above the marketplace. So that's the struggle the board is having. Unless we can negotiate those terms and find reason that's where we're out of balance with what the voters said be in the average we as board members have all said we support being above average we want the best paid and i think we're all committed to that and that's why we authorized a, a salary increase with uh, some changes in the future on the benefits um, so with that i'll call for a roll call vote on this item gore aye. holmes aye. jones no. gustafson aye Thank you very much. So now we're going to move on to our general public comment. And I've um, heard from a number of individuals. Just give me a second, and I'll announce how this is going to work. I'm going to try something a little different, and I'm going to see who gets up quickest of the two of you there. Um, uh, so we've had a lot of great public comment and participation over the last, I don't know how many meetings. Um, but we are also hearing from members of the public who haven't had a chance to address this because we've had to reduce public comment at times and wait till the end of the meeting. So what I'd like to do is um, see a show of hands of those, how many want to speak under public comment today that are here. And then also on Zoom, if you could raise your hand. So I've got about eight or nine, I think. We have one on Zoom. And one. Okay, so with that, we had allocated 15 minutes. I'm going to extend that. I'm going to go ahead and give three minutes at this time. We have always said if we didn't get through public comment, we'd come back at the end, but it looks like we can accommodate everybody with a three minute uh, timed item. 
And then I would like to ask those who haven't yet had a chance to speak to the board that you come up first. And if the rest of you have spoken, could be so gracious as to allow those individuals to come first. And then we'll alternate between who's here and who's on Zoom. Great, so welcome. Welcome, Lee Bastian with the Sheridan Municipal Advisory Council. I'm here because we have a situation in Sheridan, a dangerous situation. We have a bad accident at Highway 65 and Rioza Road. Last uh, four weeks ago, we had a three car collision with three people going to the hospital by ambulance and one going by air ambulance. The week before, we had two car collision. Several months ago, we had a fatality there. You can see the memorial there at the base of this street, uh, street light. And then several months ago, we had two semis collide. And right now, the normal commute, uh, yeah, as the traffic backs up from Main Street in Wheatland to the Riosa Road during the normal commute, but right now we don't have a normal commute because the pumpkin farm is open in Wheatland, and they're expecting over 200. They're expecting about 200,000 visitors in the two and a half months they're open. The other, the other thing is the city of Wheatland is building 545 additional homes right now to add to the commute. We, there are two project, traffic projects that, that have been approved, but they are on the lower end of the uh, priority list, and we would like to see them moved up if we could. The first one is an interchange at Riosa Road and Highway 65, and Caltrans has, per, by my understanding, has purchased the land for the, for the interchange. The other project approved is the Highway 65 Lincoln Bypass 2B, which, which, <clears throat> which makes it, adds two lanes, goes from two lanes to four lanes from West Weiss to the county line. And we would like to see something done because we're getting tired of taking people out in ambulances and stuff. And I thank you for your time. And I did, I did make this presentation to the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency last week. Thank you. Kathleen, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Kathleen Crawford, and I am commenting today um, more in asking a couple of questions about the deputy sheriff's uh, data. Um, I understand from Cindy Gustafson's recent comments that this is really much more aimed at um, curtailing benefit costs and benefit increases, and yet I haven't seen much data on that for the public to get some idea of what it's absorbing. And again, I believe that many members of the public are um, confused and angry about imposing a contract upon the uh, deputy sheriffs. Um, so I believe that you need to have more information out there so people can understand the difference between a salary and the total cost of compensation, which includes benefits, retirement, and a lot of other factors. And let's get some comparison um, information on those factors from the other counties that are involved in the average, both Sacramento and El Dorado, so that we're in a better position to be actually uh, negotiating um, in good faith uh, and not imposing a contract that is unnecessarily difficult for the sheriffs to see as being equitable. So those are my comments. Um, I appreciate um, the discussion today, which was much more civil. Um, and I believe that getting information out to the public that has more data involved could be very, very helpful. Thank you. Madam Chairman and Supervisors, I did submit uh, what I'm going to read to you today. I only mention that because there are some visuals that I wanted you to see. 
So my name is Larry Farina. I'm a land development consultant, and today I'm representing Mr. Jan Haldeman, a local builder that, and developer that has been developing properties in the Auburn area and throughout Placer County for over 40 years. I want to bring your attention to two infill projects in North Auburn that Mr. Haldeman is trying to develop. Mr. Haldeman has worked with county staff to build attainable priced housing in North Auburn. Both of these projects are within walking distance of three shopping centers, a school, a hospital, and doctor's offices. The first project that you have a picture of in front of you is called Gateway Commons, a nine unit duplex project that will be sold as 18 individual dwelling units of 940 square feet, with eight of those units having 624 square foot ADUs built on the lower floor. This project is fully entitled and is ready to pull permits to start construction. When this project received Planning Commission approval, an article was published in the Auburn Journal. I'd like to read a couple of quotes from that article. Haldeman Homes Project is a wonderful example of a developer opting to offer multi-generational housing option to meet the increasing demand for more affordable housing in Placer County, said Placer County Principal Planner Shauna Purvines. Second quote, Gateway Commons provides the practical type of housing for first-time buyers or those looking to downside, said Placer County Planning Commissioner Wayne Nader. There is also an opportunity to create rentable space with some of these new homes, thereby adding to e even more housing, which is urgently needed in the area. And lastly, Haldeman Homes decided to invest re in reasonably priced housing in our community once we participated in a stakeholder group and learned firsthand that the housing crisis facing our community, said Jan Haldeman of Haldeman Homes. With this, the publisher of this article and this kind of support, Mr. Holloman decided to take on another project called Gateway Village, the second picture in your handout. This project is on the same street, across the street, in fact, from the Gateway Commons project. This project would consist of 27 single-family homes on a 2.9-acre parcel, the homes ranging in size from 959 square feet to 1,552 square feet. Again, the intent is to create attainable priced housing. What I'm here today to tell you is that these projects have been canceled or at best put on hold indefinitely due to the, Placer, the issues that Placer County has decided need to be resolved at the developer's expense. You are probably all aware of the sewer main capacity issues in North Auburn on the SMD1 system. Due to past managers of the collective system, due to past managers of the collective system not planning ahead for future growth that has taken place, the system is at very near capacity and will not be able to accept future developments without upsizing the system. The Board of Supervisors passed an ordinance 5943B in February of 2019, which was supposed to help fix this situation. May I? Thank you. Wrap it. <laughs> According to this ordinance, all developers are supposed to pay a fee into the system to pay for sewer line upgrades, but in the event that the upgrades are needed before there is money collected to, to do so, the burden to do those upgrades falls on the property developer. In this situation with Gateway Commons, the upgrades would cost $400,000. The ordinance guarantees that the developer will be paid back for this work as funds become available. No guarantee of a timeline and no return on investment while waiting to be reimbursed. Based on the formula in the ordinance, there will have to be 316 dwellings added to the system before this reimbursement can be accomplished. One might think that the cost could simply be passed on to the future home buyer until you keep in mind that the concept of this project is to provide attainable pricing on the homes. The developer was already required by Placer County to do a sewer study at his own expense to show the county where the problems in their system are and how to fix them. This study alone cost $25,000. When I asked the county why they did not have this information or do the study themselves, the answer was we just don't have the time. Their answer to the problem is let the developer pay for it. Larry, you, I really appreciate this. Can we wrap? Are you going to read? Yeah, I'm, I'm read one paragraph it. off, OK? OK. Um, <laughs> when you add all the fees, traffic mitigation, tree mitigation, sewer expansion, park fees, and the required environmental studies, sewer study, and project engineering and design, the pro developer has already spent $400,000 before the project is even approved. And that does not include the cost of the land. While it appears that the Placer County planners want this kind of lower priced housing these infill sites, Placer County Environmental Engineering, Engineering Surveying, and Public Works Departments have made absolutely no effort to aid in this endeavor. endeavor. In fact, they do not even consider what is trying to be accomplished. They just expect the developer to pay for whatever each department feels is necessary. I'll close here. My suggestion, if I may be so bold, is that the county would actually spend their own funds 
upgrade their own sewer line and collect the fees based on their own pro program that they have in the, the ordinance that they passed. Um, I think it's a little bit ridiculous to expect developers to do that. The last point, just to make this, uh, to put this into perspective, is to ask each one of you if you'd be willing to invest $400,000 in a project with absolutely no idea when you're going to get that $400,000 back and no return on your investment when it does come back. And if you're interested in that, we'd love to have you as a partner. If you'd like to, to meet and discuss any of the hindrances we have experienced while trying to develop these properties, I will make myself available at any time to do so. Thank you very much for the time and the extra time. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate it. And if there's others for public comment, we don't have anyone else on Zoom, but I'd ask you to go ahead and line up so we can get through our public okay. comment quickly. Good morning, Scott Vaughn, Granite Bay. Been coming for six years, super good. Today I'm here on behalf of the Tree Lake Village Homeowners Association. I'm delivering two, and each of you will be receiving by certified mail a formal request for information from the HOA's legal counsel. The letter requests information that affects the quality of life for the 734 families represented by the HOA who have a legal right to know a number of facts. These include the disposition of the remaining 20 acres of undeveloped land, which was formally identified as open space for open space uses in the Tree Lake Village EIR, certified by this board in 1987. How commercial business is continued to allow to operate without any mitigation, not a tree, not a shrub, anything, lighting, so um, in our residential neighborhood. How a 14 acre, 100,000 square foot mini storage facility is allowed to operate with a single egress that in the event of a fire or any other emergencies that first responders and evacuees have to use. These three items remain in perpetuity. I'm requesting that in the interest of open and honest governance, that this board directs county staff to provide the public information requested. And I think I have a meeting scheduled with most of you supervisors to provide you the information to support this. I've met with you many times before. Um, this is a glaring hole in open and honest government because we get no answers. Ms. Schwab has told us many times before, we're not allowed the answers, it's privileged, which uh, seems quite odd since zoning is the backbone of any development. So I would ask that you take a look at this HOA's request, that you supply the information. I've also included the request we had in 2017 that was ignored and that wasn't provided. I look forward to meeting with each one of you. Thank you for your time. No, that's all right. It's hay fever season. Good morning again, Board of Supervisors. Um, I just wanted to kind of um, kind of recap what Larry spoke on is that uh, Plaza County received $44 million in CARES money. And uh, we talk about return in investment. I mean, um, what he, you know, alluded to, I think that would be a good opportunity to, uh, you know, invest some of that money for the internal investment for this community. So enough on that. Um, haven't really prepared too much. Just kind of want to just recap of what we've been coming up here speaking on for many months. And um, and I say this just because, um, you know, we got an army of, uh, you know, community behind us. You know, and quite frankly, you know, you put us all together. We are a whole lot heck smarter than you guys. And um, one of the things that we brought to you guys on June 8th was AB 262 and um, AB 389. I don't know if you remember that, but it was just kind of educating you guys as we was educating ourselves because AB 262 was passed in 2019. And, um, and basically it gives authority to the, um, to the uh, local health um, official. And uh, everything that's going on, you know, if you really track that and and if you really pay attention to what's going on in Australia and New Zealand right now, I mean, we're, you know, we're right on their coattails right now of what's going on over there. And um, so I just say that is, you know, some of these resolutions that we brought for you, you know, one in particular was for the, um, the COVID passport. And, uh, and we never saw that on the agenda, but recently we've seen two counties um, 
uh, Tehama County and also I believe Sutter County passed similar resolutions on uh, concerning um, a COVID passport in their counties. So I would really encourage you to um, retake a look at that resolution because uh, as things move on, just if we just if you look back at what we spoke on June 8th and you look forward to today, um, a lot of things that we were saying and educating you guys on are starting to come, you know, uh, we're starting to see them, you know, come, you know, here we are today. And uh, so I emailed um, uh, the clerk of the board and a few others. Um, one of the concerning things on the agenda at uh, number seven on that and i haven't had a whole lot, lot of time to really um, take a look at that but i would there's just so much there so much information one of the things that really concerned me you know when i was looking at project room key on that they have direct ties into fema camps and so there's a lot of layers a lot of things still to look at that but i would pass item number seven today and um and there's a lot more research needs to go behind that so thank, thank you. you good morning good morning board uh, back sorry jumped the gun but um uh, thank you for allowing us to speak um i had emailed the board clerk on september 13th after hearing Dr. Oldham's- I'm sorry, uh, I don't know that we got your name for the record. Jacqueline. Jacqueline, okay. thank you, thanks. Um, on September 13th, uh, regarding questions I had had in uh, the board presentation of Dr. Oldham's, and I never received a response on those, so I'm gonna just reiterate those questions here. Um, one of the questions I had were, how are cases being defined? Which tests are being used? If their PCR, has there been a standard cycle threshold um, set to avoid false positives? Um, are the tests that are being used currently um, e under the emergency use authorization or are they fully approved? And are they the ones that are be have been pulled as of December? Um, and what is, I'm not familiar, I don't understand what the other test, there's like a rapid test, what is that testing for? Um, another question I had was, how is the Delta variant being identified? How, are, how is that being, is there a test that's being used to identify the Delta variant versus regular COVID? Um, what is the relation of the flu or cold to COVID? And then in, in September, um, Dr. Oldham was mentioning that there are, uh, there's a high number of cases and a high number of uh, hospitalizations due to COVID, but I was, curious if there were you know if much of the respiratory distress was caused by the smoke i know my sister-in-law and um my brother were sick actually my sister-in-law ended up contracting double pneumonia um she is, has asthma and and it was right during that whole time with all the poor air quality and smoke so i was wondering if that had any effect on respiratory and then um, how are vaccinated versus unvaccinated being identified? Because Dr. Oldham was saying that uh, it's mainly unvaccinated in the hospitals. But I have read that the, according to the CDC, a person is considered unvaccinated until 14 days after the second shot. And in Israel, you are considered unvaccinated if you haven't received a booster. So how are we identifying unvaccinated versus vaccinated? Um, how are vaccine reactions being recorded? like what is considered a vaccine adverse event and are they being reported to VAERS? Um, I know of people who've died shortly after receiving the shot and I also have friends who are in the medical field who are seeing um, uh, cancers, uh, like a high rate of um, prostate cancer in very young men that is highly unusual who are vaccinated. So I, are we looking into those kinds of things and um, <clears throat> the board was excited about, a, or Dr. Oldham was excited about a high rate in vaccine uptake, you know, due to all the co coercion of medical professionals. I'm almost okay. done. Um, but, you know, these medical professionals, I have a friend, a good friend, who is moving to Arkansas, because in Arkansas, as a medical professional, she doesn't have a vaccine mandate. Um, <clears throat> 
and then people are being bribed with gift cards. There was a woman who called in who was super excited that, you know, these people were going to go get shoes because they got a vaccine. And then the approval of the Pfizer shot is concerning because there's, you know, the one that is approved isn't available. And I know doctors who are being told to remove vaccine-related um, events from records. So is that being looked at or addressed, or um, can we confirm that? Um, I, I'm, and then um, the, as far as the uh, hospital workers, um, I know that they're, they're moving out of state. I have a good friends who are moving out of state because they do not want this experimental shot. So, you. you know, all of these are questions I asked at that meeting and in, and again in email, and they have not been, re I have not received a response. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael. Yeah, I haven't, I was att in attendance in that meeting as well, and I haven't seen any response from Dr. Aldham. Okay. The other thing that I um, noticed is from time to time, um, Placer County, uh, posts on their Facebook page and social media um, advertisements for for people to get the vaccine. And um, yesterday they posted one. I don't probably can't see it, but that uh, talks about getting your boosters and um, who who's available. You know how you how who who's uh, eligible to get the booster and uh, how important this is. Uh, anyone aged 18 and older can get the, uh, can get the the booster and all this stuff. And I'm just was wondering like, why is Placer County in the business of promoting the vaccine? It just this seems like an inappropriate use of taxpayers' resources, especially, especially considering other things. And my um, wife has sent um, the board and Dr. Olham an, a number of questions and documentation on um, COVID and the, and, and, the, and the thing that they call the vaccine. And I was just wanted to touch on on a few of those things. Um, she's asking um, why doesn't Dr. Olham use his authority given to him under AB 262 to require all doctors in Placer County to record deaths and adverse reactions in VAERS, as well as requesting the CDPH to begin to track and record this information. And there's no response. Okay, so you guys all have. We're on the email. Maybe maybe you you don't read your email. I don't know. Um, let's see um, some other things. Uh, Placer County got a hundred million during the great COVID debac debacle. So I don't know. So maybe maybe that money comes with ties that you have to promote the vaccine. That that's concerning if that's the issue. Um, and then. Um, she says, uh, doctors and nurses here in Placer County, Sutter and Kaiser hospitals are claiming that COVID is not being treated properly, that doctors are not allowed to write prescriptions for H hydrochloroquine or ivermectin, that pharmacies are refusing to fill prescriptions for these drugs. Most frightening, the adverse effects of COVID vaccine are not being reported. Um, and then um, a little bit more. Ooh, got to hurry, got to hurry, hurry, hurry. Oh, okay. also they... The AMA is coaching the medical community on how, to, how not to answer questions from patients and how to use psychological and linguistic tools to misdirect and deceive people. It seem, that seems like a bad thing, huh? Um, the other thing that I want to talk about real quickly is um, fair elections. Uh, I, I participated in the last election. I was just wondering what Placer County is doing to ensure that we have fair elections. And, um, Chair uh, Wagant said that um, Ms. Mr. Ronco could do something, show, show us what, what you guys are doing, and we'll be very interested. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Again, I'm going to ask how many more are here to speak under public comment? Three. Seeing the three here. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Derby, and um, I have notes, but I always go off on a tangent. But anyways, I wanted to ask why I saw a commercial promoting the fact that we are going to have mobile vaccination sites on school campuses for junior high and high schools when 
I thought that you guys were not going to allow something like that, and it really makes me sad because there's a 99.99% survival rate for children. My kids got COVID, and it didn't do anything to them. They're fine. I got COVID. I'm fine. My parents got COVID. They're fine. This is insane. There's so many viruses. You cannot isolate a virus. It's impossible. Also, my daughter has a job. She had to get tested. And you know how hard it is to find a test? Everything's out of stock. And then when you get a test, finally, you have to register it online. That says government psyops all over to me. That makes no sense. Also, let's see, the death rate. AFDLS called for immediate stop to the vaccines because the Vayers whistleblower had up to 45,000 deaths of the vaccine being administered within 72 hours. But there's a lawsuit for that because we're trying to hide numbers. I do have numbers for August. I, I can't find September for some reason. But through Vayers, the deaths, 13,000, that's just one reporting site too, by the way, there's three of them. 13,000, but it's really 45,000 if you look at the lawsuit, which you can look up, it's, it's public. Um, urgent care, 72,000. Bell's palsy, 4681. Doctor visits, injury reaction, 98,761. Permanently disabled, 18,000. The list goes on, there's a lot here. Okay, so there's a lot of reactions happening to the vaccine and they want to put this on our children. And then if they're 12 and up, they don't even need our consent. And they also put mental health counselors on campuses to say, oh, your child looks like it has, she has a problem. I'm sorry, but I have health insurance for that. I don't need my kids to go to school to, to be picked on. They need to go there for an education. It's disgusting that we're allowing this. It goes against the Nuremberg Code, which is experiments done on humans in a really horrible time in history, the Holocaust. Everybody is sad about the Holocaust, I would surely hope, and that's what's happening right now. We are trying to depopulate and we're going to a guy that is a computer programmer that is investing all the money in all this stuff and, and he thinks he has a cure even though he wanted to depopulate the world by 20% with a vaccine. So the tests, the money that you guys also supported, which was billions, and I have the number somewhere, it's, I don't know how to say the number, it's so big, but almost 9.2 9 .2 billion in partnerships with health and school departments and the grants, Prop 98, with the partnerships of services to for the corona relief funds, is that why we're following these guidelines? Because you guys think they're just guidelines, but people are pushing them on us, and it's, it's sick. And my kids can't breathe in a mask, and I will not ever have them in a mask unless they're really sick, which still is gross. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and I do have a couple callers on Zoom. Let's go to a Zoom, um, and then I'll come back to you. Thank you. Marcella, unmute your mic and give your comments. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, board. I've been working as a hospital RN for over two decades, and the manner in which I have seen this entire pandemic being played has been so disturbing. It is evident that the manipulation of data, the focus on confirmed cases, and the botched science are going to continue to be pushed on us with an agenda of a segregated society. Segregation and vaccine passports have no place in a civilized society. They don't even have a place in ethical medicine. I cannot speak for the medical professionals who are going along with this, except that they are under a spell, but I can tell you that these very professionals are forgetting the very oath they took to protect the right of autonomy of the individual and just and fair treatment of them as well. The PCR test is not a diagnostic test, and yet it's being used to dictate what public health measures are to be put in place affecting the millions of the state with absolute recklessness to the negative consequences. Our health authorities want everyone to test with this emergency use authorization test to justify everything they are doing when the PCR test can pick up ancient flu or coronavirus fragments and can easily be manipulated to make anything positive if you turn the amplification cycles high enough. For this reason, it's about time that we are being told how many cycles these tests are being run. And I am calling on Dr. Olden to find out this critical information 
and start reporting this along with the confirmed cases he reports. The only test for live viruses is viral culture. PCR and lateral flow tests do not distinguish live viruses. No test of infection or infectiousness is currently available. As things stand, a person who tests positive with any kind of test may or may not have an active infection with the live virus and may or may not be infectious. I have the BMJ article. I would love to, to uh, email you guys to back that statement up. This entire narrative that asymptomatics are a danger to society has never been proven and was yet another reckless assumption that was made by authorities further dividing our society and creating unnecessary fear. I have yet to see our authorities tell us to check our vitamin D blood level, to increase our vitamin C and zinc intake, to lose weight and go outside for a walk. Instead, our authorities have created fear. Creating fear is a weapon with destructive consequences. Bribing people with money and the worst foods imaginable is the weapon I have seen authorities use. Creating fear has done nothing to improve anyone's health besides wreck it. I am calling on the board and Dr. Oldham to do the right thing and stop pandering to the fear tactics. Dr. Oldham, I'm asking you to uphold your oath to do no harm and to protect autonomy and justice. I am opposed to a segregated society and I am opposed to mandatory medical interventions such as masks, PCR tests and vaccines. I am and always will be opposed to vaccine passports and I ask that you assure Placer County these will not be welcome here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I have one more uh, caller on Zoom and two here and then we'll close public comment at this time. Uh, so go ahead here in the room, you come up and then we'll go to Zoom and then we'll finish with the woman behind you. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Wendy Beal. I am with Moms for Liberty Placer County. Uh, just a few things. I did watch the meeting last week. I was actually at the Board of Supervisors meetings for Sac County, um, the last Board of Supervisors meeting that you had. And what I can say is it is a stark difference from the board here. Um, and I can also say that living in Placer County, I am very thankful because we wouldn't still be in California if it weren't for all of you and the work that um, you have done to keep this county moving and are supporting our small businesses. Um, I am a bit concerned about what has happened in terms of repealing Measure F. Um, the people spoke, so I don't know why there couldn't have been some sort of compromise in the negotiating and um, the way that that was done. So what I will say is just in talking to people in the community, I, f I believe that it has created distrust for some of these board members and I'm hoping that you all are able to bridge that gap somehow. Um, in moving forward with this contract for the sheriffs. Um, my concern is also just how that's going to affect them once this board leaves, um, or you know, if, if this board leaves. Um, so I wanted to mention that I know and I'm learning more about the Board of Supervisors of what you guys can and cannot do. We are here to advocate um, we are Moms for Liberty, Placer County, and our mission is to unify, educate, and empower parents and the community to protect their rights in all level of government. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan group dedicated to promoting the ideals of liberty, individual rights, and limited government. We are here to support our elected officials that believe in this mission. And I know your guys' hands are tied in a lot of the educational issues. Um, what I can tell you is our public schools are falling apart. Over 600 students from Rockland Unified have left the district. If they force this mandate, I see a large amount of families um, leaving. I'm here today to offer a branch of support to the community for those of, the, you, for those of you that want freedom to choose for your child so that they can go to school and breathe fresh air for those of you that want the freedom to make a choice to vaccinate or not vaccinate your child um, and that, 
these studies have no longer, just one more minute if this is okay. We at Moms for Liberty Placer County are forming homeschool pods. We are offering tutoring and resources and empowering families to leave this failed system if it continues to fail us. We are working to elect members of the community who want to fight to maintain these rights. This should be an, um, and overall we are here to stop normalizing schools dictating conditions for the students to access a free and public education. Join us, and just so that you know, we do not co-parent with the government. And so that is what we stand for at Moms for Liberty. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Okay, I see somebody else has joined the line. I really, I mean, I had announced several times, please line up. I'm so sorry, but we're, tr okay. I'm sorry for that. Um, we can take public comment at the end of the meeting, but we're gonna close after these last two public comment items. So um, Zoom and then you, ma'am. Thank you. Nettie, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, thank you. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, the people, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. We the people govern ourselves and the line has been clearly drawn in the sand. It is time that the Board of Supervisors pick a side. You can no longer sit on the fence and waver between freedom and communism. The people will not stand for it. We are done and we understand that you are not listening to us. We have put resolutions forward requesting that you speak for the people because that is your job to represent the community, to represent the people. We have told you that there will be forced vaccinations. We see that FEMA is coming in through Project Room Key and that the county is using our taxpayers' dollars to house homeless within our communities. Our community of Placer County is becoming unsafe. And the reason it's becoming unsafe is because our, our county and our nation is being dismantled from within. It's coming from the top down and the bottom up, and it's being done through egos and through blood money. And as Placer County continues to accept the money, we will continue to lose our freedoms and we will continue to lose our liberties. And it's time that people stand up and do civil disobedience and stop complying with the masks and stop complying with the false mandates. The more you comply, you continue to give your freedoms away. And the people that are sitting up there expressing what's called arbitrary power do not have power over us. They do not have the power over your children. So it is time for Placer County residents to make a stand and stop complying. Stop asking for permission to live your life. Stop asking for permission to keep your children from being abused. The time is now, or you will be forever on your knees. And continue to pray, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for waiting. <laughs> sure. Um, Hello, Placer County Board of Supervisors. My name is Yvette Horn. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and thank you for your service. Um, on behalf of uh, citizens, we appreciate all that you do. Um, I just have a few comments. Uh, I'm a parent of a high school student at Placer High School. I recently had a student that graduated last spring and unfortunately he was a casualty of COVID-19 halfway through his junior year, all of his senior year, 
you know, sports until the very end of the senior year, very limited, no social events, nothing. It was devastating. I can tell you from on behalf of my son and all his friends, it was devastating. Um, these kids work so hard and the measures that were taken were just, it was horrible. Um, I have some, and I also have a son that's a junior at Placer High School. So, um, you know, I'm speaking now on his behalf and all the other students. I also represent a group um, of parents that are forming uh, called Placer Union High School District, um, Parents for Choice, because we're an advocate of choice for choice for vaccines, choice for testing, choice for masking. Um, COVID-19 vaccine is experimental. The FDA really did a bait and switch. The only licensed approved vaccine right now is Pfizer Comirnaty. Pfizer BioNTech remains under EUA status, emergency use authorized status. A lot of people aren't aware of this. The only Pfizer vaccine that is currently available in the United States is Pfizer BioNTech. So people are unwittingly getting that vaccine thinking it's approved legally licensed approved. It's not. Pfizer Comirnaty is not available in the United States. It has not been manufactured and who knows when it's going to be manufactured. That is a fact. Um, right now, I know you're limited in what you can do with the schools, but I just have some comments just on behalf of the students, parents and students. Uh, right now, parents and students are faced with um, mandating vaccines testing and masking in schools effective January 1st. So you have to get vaccinated, you have to get tested each week, and you have to continue to mask. That's what's coming down the pike right now in the state of California, and um, I, it's outrageous. Um, we also know, um, you know that the vaccine mandates and the vaccine passports, that's also coming down the pipe effective probably in January the, the state will probably pass legislation for that all of this is unconstitutional and I'm asking for the Placer County Board of Supervisors to please take a stand on behalf of the citizens in this county please 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 we are counting on you to stand up for our rights we we really appreciate anything that you can do on our behalf thank you thank you I want to thank everyone um, for public comment today and I do believe at least some of the answers have been posted online and I'm going to ask uh, our county CEO to provide that link to some of I think Jacqueline's questions and other comments that were made. Yeah, so one thank you. Um, so obviously we've had a number of questions of folks asking that they've submitted questions and haven't received a response. One of the things that we've tried to do is address these questions so they're not just going back to the individual, they're going back to the, the masses. And so what we do, we have a FAQ section in under our public health uh, page. It's the annual or quarterly, I say it's not quarterly, they, they do an update around COVID uh, fairly frequently. The most recent COVID update uh, under um, uh, the public health area really speaks to many of these questions that were asked. Let me uh, give the quick link. It's actually fairly long, but I mean, you can go to our website as well and, and dial in. It's uh, obviously plaster.ca.gov uh, backslash document center, all one word, backslash view, backslash 54922, backslash COVID update 93 final. So a long link. Um, but we, we can provide that to you. The FAQs give answers to all the questions or many of those questions. If there's anything different, uh, please reach out to your individual supervisor. You can also contact me directly um, and I will appropriately get that, uh, those uh, questions answered. But we're trying to address them in a more organized manner through our FAQs based on the questions that were raised during public comment and ones that have been submitted to date. Yes, I just have one request, Todd. Would it be possible to put that link on our agendas, somewhere on the agenda for the next couple of months while we navigate our way through COVID? Just because most people will easily go to our agenda and they could find that website probably much easier if we sure. could do that. Uh, we'll, we'll make that available. Great, thanks.
Any board member reports? I have none. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Um, I did want to let everybody know <clears throat> that a couple of weeks ago I swore in the new fire chief for South Placer Fire District. It was quite an honor. The new fire chief is uh, Chief Durer. And then uh, this past Sunday, I had, I had the honor of attending uh, an Eagle Scout Court of Honor where four new Eagle Scouts were recognized and I presented a certificate of recognition on behalf of the Board of Supervisors to these four young men, quite extremely well accomplished young men. It would make any parent proud and uh, I felt proud and they weren't even my kids. Um, and also, uh, this last weekend, I attended one of my community's HOA, their annual HOA meeting, and it was a lot of fun. They were excited that I showed up, and they had lots of questions, and um, I told them a little bit about what's going on in the county. So I um, just wanted to let you all know. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. And Bonnie, did you have any board member report? I had just one report, and that is I'm going to be holding a, a virtual meeting, an online meeting for West Placer. It's about water uh, because there's lots of questions as we have increased development in the area and we've got concerns about a drought. You know, what are we doing with the water situation? So we will have representatives from PCWA, Placer County Water Agency, the City of Roseville, and others addressing concerns about water. And that will be online Tuesday, October 5th at 5.30 p.m. You're welcome to register and you can register uh, by going to my website, um, placer.ca.gov forward slash Bonnie Gore and the information is there for you to click on and get the link to the Zoom um, town hall. So you are all welcome to join us. And for those in the audience, there's a card like this uh, sitting at the table in front. Um, and that's it for me, thank you. Thank you, and I had one item to report as well. I did meet with Insurance Commissioner Lara. He toured some properties, uh, res private residential properties in the Alta community and in Auburn, uh, and we talked quite extensively about uh, his efforts to try to have recognition for fire from fire insurance companies for the work people are doing on their properties and to offer more discounts on insurance uh, when people are taking actions to defend um, their space. So he continues to work on that effort and was able to visit with some of our uh, residents who've done outstanding work to provide um, defensible space for their properties, but maybe not uh, seeing that kind of effort from our state uh, Department of Transportation along their right of way. So especially in the Alta area where many of you know we have experienced quite a few truck fires coming down the Interstate 80 grade. So continuing to work on that um, very important issue to our constituents. Um, Todd, did you have any report for us today? I, I didn't have any additional items. Okay, well, um, I did my best to try to keep us on time. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll get now to our 945 item, which is uh, Placer County Visitors Bureau presentation. And I know you've been waiting patiently back there. Thank you uh, while we took public comment. Good morning, Madam Vice Chair and members of the board. This is for your board's consideration, just an informational item. Uh, the Placer County Visitors Bureau is halfway through a two-year contract, and I thought it would be appropriate and timely for uh, Robert Haswell, their CEO, to give you an update. Um, they had an interesting year um, in terms of marketing our great county, and I thought, what a better time than now to uh, have Rob give you all an update and entertain any questions. With that, Rob Haswell. <clears throat> the technologically challenged Rob Haswell will see if he can figure the <laughs> buttons out. Do I, do I just go Todd right, left? Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, Vice Chair Gustafson, Board of Supervisors, just really delighted to get a chance to speak with you, give you a little bit of information about what we've been trying to do on our part. Uh, you know, to help bolster, you know, Placer County's um, economic recovery, you know, over the past year and a half. And it's been quite a year, as you know. And uh, really happy to do this. I, I, I know that Supervisor Jones has, um, 
I've not presented with you, so there will be a little bit of overview about who we, you know, what we are and stuff. So uh, I think that'll be great, and uh, we'll go from there. Also, uh, I was reminded uh, earlier by uh, former Supervisor Euler that he's dressed more appropriately to do a visit plaza presentation than I am, and <laughs> he's not wrong, actually. Uh, let's see here. Ah, uh, there it is. See? He t <laughs> anyway, uh, just real quick, uh, puts, I just want to give you guys a little a sense of what our structure is. You know, we're the Placer County Visitors Bureau. We have two, uh, two charges, really. We're the uh, destination marketing organization for the county. So that's our Visit Placer, and you can find us, visitplacer.com, uh, at Visit Placer on our social. That's kind of where we do the county marketing. Uh, we also run the California Welcome Center. Uh, in Auburn, which uh, is, is our storefront, and uh, I'll skip to that bullet. What's interesting about that is uh, we're super proud to be part of uh, the California Welcome Center Network. We're one of only 19 um, uh, designated welcome centers, so we get the blue signage uh, that you see when you drive around the state. It's really a nice uh, validator for the work that we're doing. It's great for international visitors, all of it, so real good there. Um, in, our, in, in our marketing work, we have a couple of organizations that we partner with that do a lot of the help. You'll see some of their work today. Uh, Faith Mari is a, a spectacular social media person out of Sacramento, and she does a lot of our organic social. And we have a, a marketing agency, Abby Agency out of Reno, who's really good as well, and, and you, you'll see a lot of their work. So uh, that gives you that. So I want to play a quick video because it's always more interesting than hearing me talk is to see some cool visual, visuals. This is, this is a, a video we made for the summer um, and it's uh, still running. Uh, we think it really fits the vibe that we are trying to go for here at Placer. We, we're a, uh, our tagline is life at its peak and, and we really believe that's a, an easy one to get behind here in Placer. So um, if Jeremy will play the video. We had to work this out yesterday. Little time. There it is. So we uh, we're playing that as you can see across several social uh, media channels. Uh, got about these stats are not quite updated. We got probably over two hundred thousand views ongoing. Again, we're really looking for you know starting to promote a vibe out here, what we are, who we are, what it's like to come out and visit us, and uh, you know we we feel like our response has been really great on that front. So happy to be making those kinds of uh, uh, videos. Have a great board. Just wanted to make sure I shout it out to them. Uh, super, uh, and we got our staff, uh, marketing director M Tiffany McKenzie's in the room. Um, but if you'll kind of just look down the, the list, I think you'll see we've, we really try to get a broad uh, spectrum of not just industries and folks, but uh, areas of coverage, you know, folks in, in Roseville and, and, and Lincoln and Auburn, obviously. Uh, so really, really, really proud of our board. I think they really uh, all obviously love our county, but they also bring a lot of, of firepower to, to our mission. So real happy with that. Some of our key stakeholder organizations that we do work with, obviously uh, your economic development uh, department is number one. Uh, Resort Association, Placer Grown, Vintners. Uh, P, you know, PVT, all of these organizations um, we have done work with. We like collaboration. We believe that, you know, 
collaboration actually uh, is a more effective tool in terms of trying to get a multiplier effect when you're trying to get your work out there in front of folks. So um, Gold Country Visitor Association is one of the more respected and coming uh, regional organizations in the Visit California world. So um, again, we're very active in that, in that, uh, in that organization. So <laughs> you can't talk about the last 18 months without talking about that giant straight down line you see on that graphic. Um, tourism is huge, huge industry in California and United States and in Placer County. And you can see dating back from 2010, it's been a billion dollar industry here in County. Uh, in 19, 2019, you see we peaked at 1.5 billion. Uh, so huge job creator. Uh, tax base, all kinds of stuff. 2020, COVID, uh, probably no industry was hit harder nationwide than hospitality and travel, and, and we're no different. Uh, we almost lost half our, our value, uh, $800 million uh, 2020 revenue year, uh, or spending year, I should say, which is obviously devastating. So um, really important that you know, what we've been finding out in, in our industry is it's super important that you actually really actively address this. Like you have to, you can't go too dark and it's really hard because when you're, when, as you'll all remember, um, over the past 18 months, we've had fits and starts. We've had hopes that things were going to open up and we'd put, we'd put campaigns together and we'd start working on them. And then, you know, a wave would hit and things had to kind of go silent and you had a lot of, you know, you had to keep holding things at different times in our, you know. So you had to be really agile as an organization. And um, so we felt like we did that really well. We, we put together a travel responsibly and safety video uh, and a shop local video, which we'll show at the end of the presentation. Uh, two things that we were doing to try to address our folks here on the ground, try to be uh, real active in, 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 you know, supporting our business community and also supporting residents who have concerns, uh, you know, we get a lot of drive, you know, one of the things that Placer County, uh, you know, benefited from during this time is obviously our outdoors uh, access is amongst the best in the state. So uh, a lot of people were coming out here just because it was, you know, one of the few sort of life affirming things you could do. So we had a lot of drive folks coming in uh, and there was some concern that folks didn't know how to, you know, really take care of their trash and stuff like that. So, you know, we really wanted to make sure that we had a, a, a you know, a, a be responsible message mo moving forward. Um, and despite all that, you know, here's what some of the things that we have managed to do anyway. We, uh, we've had over 3 million impressions on our stuff that we've put out uh, throughout the last year, 100,000 engagements. Engagements is somebody actually, you know, takes an interest in your post likes it, comments, shares, those kinds of things. Every time one of those things happen, that gets you a broader kind of audience, which we really believe is, is our job, is, is to really raise the brand recognition of Placer County, because we feel like it's one of the great brands to promote. And counties come with their own, with their own challenges, because people don't know counties, you know, unless you're Napa basically, right? Otherwise, they know destinations within counties. So our goal is to make a Placer brand become something that's distinguishable from all our neighbors. So uh, you see we did some paid campaigns, 650,000 impressions there, 50 media placements, um, including a national placement. We'll see uh, what that was in a second with uh, over almost 30 million uh, people in readership. So really making strides to get our, our name out there. And, and, and we, think it's, we think we've been pretty effective at it. Here's some things we've done over the past year. We revamped our website uh, to make it more accessible, to make it user friendly. The Find Yourself in Placer campaign, um, we redid our map. So if you look in the middle of that slide, we have an interactive map on our homepage. And what's really cool about that is we did, we did some, a bunch of video and still work to um, accent all of our towns. So if you go in to our map and click on any one of the communities that is notated, you'll see a sizzle video. So we find that people really do like to see things. If you're gonna go to Colfax, 
you know, you've never been there, what does it look like? You know, and, and so we've got some awesome drone uh, footage. You know, I, I encourage you to look at them though. It's, it's, it's something that we think is, you know, if we can drive people there while they're trying to decide where they might go, it's gonna give them a better, a better feel, a better reason to want to do it. Uh, we also employed some folks to do blogging. Uh, you know, they have followers, they're called these influencers. You know, there's all these terms, we all know them now, but, but they come in and, 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 they, and they write about, you know, the great things to do. So we have that whole campaign put together um, and revamped our newsletter, which is really gonna be important because those are folks that we can directly talk to. They've shown an interest. We can push campaigns, we can push our, you know, shop local to those folks. You know, when you build your list, your email list, it's really, uh, a, it becomes a fundamental tool that is helpful in, in turning awareness, you know, into bookings and that sort of thing. So I just want to run quickly, and I know we got limited time, but, um, you know, this was a, uh, an article that uh, Men's Journal did where uh, the, uh, we got uh, the Hidden Valley, uh, or Hidden um, Falls run was one of the top 15 in the nation by Men's Journal. So 5.6 5 million, you know, those, that's where our agency is out working. They're, you know, we're pitching these guys, you know, and, and it's a big get for us, we think. And, you know, again, the broader we kind of get these things going. Uh, Visit California, the preeminent and most muscular um, travel destination um, agency in the world has really, really, um, dug in on a lot of our stuff. So we're known as one of the best places to see poppies. This is a story they ran on their blog with their, you know, they've got, you know, uh, I think their social media reach is over 3 million, you know, it's, it's legit. So uh, that's been a, a relationship that's gotten better because of the work that we've uh, done. It's in particularly uh, Tiffany. Red Cycle, great family, one of the most go-to family blog, you know, on-site websites in the country. You know, they picked up our blog. Uh, did a little local open for business, Forest Hill with the local guys, that was fun. Uh, so here's some stuff that we've done where we did some paid, you'll see our branding. We did a co-op with the city of Auburn there on the right. Uh, we've done a few of those. Uh, you'll see we're really digging in on the life at its peak. Uh, uh, theme because uh, there's really nowhere in, in our county that it doesn't apply as far as, as we're concerned. Um, so digital ads, you'll see kind of that same idea. This runs across a lot of different mediums. Just wanted to give you guys a flavor of some of the things that, you know, is, are out there on behalf of the county. Um, some paid ads that we've done. Um, you know, you, you can see we do videos. We have uh, um, the, the scroll, the scroll type. Uh, that's where, you know, the language is, eludes me, uh, but carousel. carousel, thank you. <laughs> so we did a video, are we, one of the things that we did take advantage of during this time, this time of uncertainty was we knew we could get more content because content is king in this world. So did a great, did a really great photo shoot. We went out to wineries, we went to Loomis, down to Roseville, Auburn. Uh, Clementine uh, just really dug in because we felt like our our um, library, when it gets bolstered up, becomes something we can really uh, lean on as we move forward. Um, some more shots from from that shoot. Um, you'll see. Uh, again, we had a lot of fun with it. You know, one of the things I think you're you're trying, we hopefully you're getting from the photos is this idea that. There are peak moments, and, and we all remember them, right? We all go out, you know, that time you went out, you know, uh, to Tahoe on a, on a beautiful day and saw some, the sun rising, and you're like, man, does it get any better than this, right? That's kind of what we're digging in on. Um, these are the, um, some of the videos from our, uh, from our uh, you know, for our map. They're just pictures that you can see that are all part of that, so super cool. A few videos that we did. Um, again, just uh, and, you know, kind of give you the scope of things. If you haven't been to our Welcome Center, I hope you can come by. It's great. It's right in Central Square. Got a lot of good, got a lot of great goods. We've, you know, our staff really knows how to put you into places that uh, that'll be fun for you. Uh, you know, we get five to ten. It's down a little because of the, you know, the, the travel restrictions, but. Uh, 
you know, it's just a really good asset for, for the county that we have, you know, the Welcome Center, for sure. Largest distributor, uh, distributor of collateral in the county. So you come in, you need a map of almost anywhere. Plus, we've got them from all over California as well. So um, had to do the COVID pivot, as we've kept talking about. And I'm just going to, I kind of want to end on this because this was a really, um, a really big, and then I'll have a few, one or two remarks after. But it last, it was really important that we, we have this notion of being able to spin and do things in a quick way. So right around Black Friday, right after Thanksgiving, the county went forward with an initiative to shop local. And it was pretty whirlwind. Like we kind of all put it together. I know uh, Mayor Gore, when she was mayor, or, you know, was involved, right? Were you mayor when, you, when we did that? Supervisor. Supervisor. But you did a thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there, there was a lot of interaction amongst you. You guys hopefully remember it. We got word on Monday or Tuesday that they wanted to, us to get involved and try to do a video and uh, wanted to release it by Friday and over Thanksgiving holiday. So, um, you know, we did it. Uh, we're super proud of it. We think it really hit a good note to kick off that campaign, which we think was uh, really, really effective. So, Jeremy, can you do your magic? He told me we had these five second delays, so that's when I got to do the stand up thing. <laughs> oh, Jeremy, don't fail me now. Our local placer businesses are the backbone of our communities. They give to our charities and sponsor our sports teams. They provide unique products, make up our amazing downtown storefronts, and provide jobs for our local residents. They're always there for us. And now, more than ever, we need to be here for them. So this holiday season, please show your love for local and shop Placer. Your neighbors are counting on you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. So we, I mean, obviously, we were super happy with it. We're super proud to even have that opportunity to um, be a small part of the larger ongoing effort to really uh, move Placer forward in this way that was um, is so important and, and I just want to say like it's been an honor you know for the three years that I've had a chance to run this and to work on behalf of this great county and all the and all the partners that we have within it and I really believe Placer County is one of the most well positioned counties in the entire state to really have a huge uh, you know resurgence uh, we have all the assets we have the right mentality um, and, you know, one, there's an old saying that um, it's only old in my industry, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, uh, tourism is the first date of economic development, and it really is. So we feel like we can, you know, we have a role, an important role to play as this county uh, emerges as, you know, the number one destination in the entire state of California. So. Thank you for spending some time. I probably went over, didn't I? <laughs> Thanks, it's Cindy. Anyway, if you have any questions, happy to take them. Thanks um, so much, Rob. Really appreciate both you and Sherry in this um, presentation. So board members, any questions? Jim. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, and I, you know, I know, thank, I want to thank you for hanging in there for these last 18 months. Yeah. We're We've been hanging in here almost getting hung sometimes. <laughs> it's close. <laughs> but, you know, you took advantage of the, you know, the downturn. You took advantage to do things to make your, your organization shine. And I, I, absolutely apparent by the program that you just presented. So, um, and I know you're a longtime Placer County guy. So, yeah. uh, kudos to you. Thank well, you so much. Thank you so much, Supervisor Holmes. I really appreciate that. Okay. And I, you know, I, I know you know more about uh, the, this area than anyone, so I, that's high praise. And Supervisor, Supervisor Jones, I know we had talked about getting you, you know, getting a little tour, so hopefully we can get that scheduled back on the book. Right. I, and did I, you have a question? Yes, I'd love to um, be in, invited to tour. You bet. And I just wanted to say it was a great presentation, uh, a nice opener, and I'm sure a good presentation for any people that are new to Placer County as well. Well, thank, thank you. you. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah, and Rob, thank you very much. Actually, you know what would be great? Would you share with us um, some of 
some of the videos that we might be able to share with our residents because I think to Suzanne's point, um, right, we have a lot of new residents in our community yeah. and you know, I'm reminded what wonderful assets we have in our community to visit, you yeah. know, especially being outdoors. For sure. Um, so it would be great if you could you know, share some of those with us so we can share those with um, our, our constituents Ab and our residents. Absolutely. No, that's, that's I'll be happy to do that. Also, um, we're, I'm going to be, we're going to be attending uh, the Placer Business Alliance trip to D.C. And one of the things we're doing is we're expanding on the main summer video to make it a more fully, you know, encaptured Placer County video. So hopefully we'll launch that then. And our plan is to do a lot of uh, outreach over the next year here on the ground. So I'll definitely uh, send you guys the links to all the different videos that we have. And hopefully you'll be able to share them out. That'd be awesome. Thanks again. And I just, I just on behalf of all of us, I know we feel the same, that you've done so much to help our small businesses and hospitality industry recover. Uh, who were so hard hit during the pandemic. And so thanks for the efforts to bring them back and, oh. and oh, help support was... the dollars we've allocated yeah. and you've furthered. So great I... job, Rob. And no. I know there's nobody who loves Placer more than you, <laughs> other than maybe Supervisor Holmes. Yeah. <laughs> and all of us. Yeah, I was going to say, everybody in the room probably, everybody. right? You know, if we get, you know, just everybody becomes an advocate, and that's, that's how you win at the end of the day. Great. Yes. Uh, I just want to thank you uh, for promoting and not forgetting our awesome farmers markets. Yes. Oh That's my right. God! And I think on that <laughs> on that note, we might hear from some of those folks. But before Timing we do that, I do need to ask for any public comment on this item. Anything on Zoom? Oh yes, go ahead. Hi, uh, Patrick Storm with Lemon Tree Agency, a subcontractor for Placer Grown. Um, I know that we're going to be presenting next as well, but I wanted to take this time to say that Rob and his entire team have been our absolute best advocate with Placer Grown. Um, he is a true asset to all of our efforts and incredibly supportive, and I wanted to congratulate him on uh, an incredible time during a very difficult period in our community. So thank you. Great. Thank you. And so seeing no other public comment, Rob, I just wanted to again thank you and your board for the incredible work. And thank you so much for having us and, and all your support of our work. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Okay. With that, we'll move on to our 10 a.m. timed item, our Agriculture Commission Agricultural Crop Report. Josh, I see you here. Good morning. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Josh Hunsinger. I'm the Placer County Agricultural Commissioner. With me today is Carol Arnold, who is the Executive Director for the Placer Grown Organization. And so uh, first, I'd like to um, make a few remarks just about uh, what a pleasure it is to be with you today um, and how fortunate I feel to be part of agriculture right now in Placer County. Um, you know, we've had some tough times recently, right? Right now we're in a drought. And when I look around the state and I see the struggles that agriculture's in, I feel really fortunate about the amazing water system we have in Placer County. And, and while it is a serious thing here in Placer County, it, it could be so much worse. Uh, and so really um, that that's something we're keeping an eye on. But at the same time, I feel really blessed about the the tremendous uh, water agencies we do have that serve our growers here as well as our public. Um, as far as land use goes, I feel really fortunate about the general plan we have and some of the ordinances we have here in Placer County, which are really starting to, I'd say, come to fruition, like the winery and brewery ordinance that was passed not too long ago by your board. Uh, we're starting to see some really cool new projects come into the county. Uh, looking at that ordinance and saying, hey, there's a real opportunity for me to invest and bring more agriculture into Placer County and bring, bring business here to Placer County. And um, that's just exciting. You know, as we'll, we'll talk about some other areas in addition to the wineries and breweries where agriculture is really growing in the county right now. Uh, the support that you have for the ag marketing program as well and, and the continued support for that. This, Carol's going to talk about that in a minute, but this is the 20 year anniversary of the agricultural marketing program that the, that the county agriculture department has uh, done and has gone through a number of different iterations. But throughout that time, the board has really been supportful of as an economic development tool, as a, as a tool kind of what I 
I tell people is the best way to preserve open space is to keep farmers in business and keep them making money and then they'll keep farming and they'll keep preserving that open space, keep that land on the tax rolls and um, keep pr producing uh, food for our citizens as well. And so I really appreciate your support and I feel really fortunate about uh, being here in Placer County at this time. So uh, moving to the next slide, um, what's really exciting to report about the 2020 crop report is that it is our highest record crop report ever. And it's the first time we've broken that $90 million barrier. And so there was a variety of reasons why that happened. I'll talk about in a minute, but um, I do want to put the disclaimer out first that this is not the profitability of agriculture in Placer County. This is just the gross revenues, the gross crop value of what we call the farm gate value or the raw um, crop value. It's not anything to do with value added. It's not anything to do with profit or net profit or anything like that. It's just the gross value of the ag commodities as, as they left the farm. And so this is the first time uh, that $90 million barrier was breached. It's about $4 million over the 2019 crop report, which was also our uh, now second highest on record. So we've had two record crop reports in a row, which is really exciting. Um, moving to the next slide, a um, couple things. So I'll highlight the top five crops in that crop report. Uh, the first, um, rice remains our top crop, followed by cattle, and then walnuts, timber, and then almonds. And almonds, this is the first time almonds have ever been um, in the top five on our crop report. You have to go back decades and decades to even find almonds listed on our crop report in the past. And so that's a real new trend. Um, the, nut, the nut trees in Placer County, as I think I've shared with you in past years related to the crop report, we've seen about a tenfold increase in nut tree acreage in western Placer County within the last five years. So it's just been really explosive growth in that. And those are very high value per acre, kind of dollar per acre crops. And so I think you'll see that trend continuing where both walnuts and almonds will continue to move up that list as um, these are very young trees and they're just in early production. We have quite a bit of acreage which isn't even in production yet. And so I think you'll see those numbers increasing um, as time goes on. For 2021, I would expect also, I'm, we haven't you know, obviously closed that season out and run those numbers, but I would say that rice and cattle with the drought, I would see that those uh, both, I would anticipate they may take a little bit of a hit. Uh, we're seeing less rice acreage planted this year as compared to 2020. And then, um, you know, cattle, I'm, I'm not sure how much of a sell-off we'll see. You know, when there's, when there's a drought, there's not as much feed out there. The feed that is available is more expensive. And so some ranchers may choose to sell off their herds, which may create a temporary bump in, in the amount of uh, cattle value followed by kind of a decline as we have less, less cows in the, in the county overall. So um, overall, we also saw some trends in our, our smaller, more direct market crops, the, the stuff that's sold at a farm stand or a farmer's market or direct to consumers. And so Carol's gonna talk a little bit more about that. And so at this point, um, again, thank you for the opportunity to serve as your agricultural commissioner. It's exciting to be at a time when agriculture is really on an upswing in the county. And I'm going to turn it over to Carol Arnold. Good morning. Yeah, thank you. So um, my name is Carol Arnold, and I'm the executive director of Placer Grown. Um, this is the 20th anniversary of the Ag Marketing Program, and I thought it'd be fun today to, the video has some numbers in it and stuff, but I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at um, what the support of the Board of Supervisors and the Ag Marketing Program has done, because it's pretty phenomenal. Um, in June of 2001, the Placer County Board of Supervisors voted to endorse a new concept, the Agricultural Marketing Program. This year, we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the program, and would like to say thank you to this board for your continued support of the program and your broad support of agriculture in Placer County. It's not a surprise that although the approach to marketing agriculture has changed in a myriad of ways, the goals have not. The program is dedicated now, as it was in 2001, to raising awareness of the scope and quality of Placer County agriculture and to advocate for our farming community. As I said, the marketing program has evolved over the years. Let's take a look at a few of those changes. 
In 2001, one of the goals was to develop and publish an ag guide. In 2001, this goal was practical. There were fewer than 10 commercial mandarin growers and less than 20 commercial farms. Today, with over 80 mandarin growers in the county, a burgeoning wine industry, and dozens of commercial farms, we would have to publish a small book to list our agricultural operations. Another goal in 2001 was to develop promotional materials and print ads. Rack cards, maps, and ag guides were useful tools in 2001. In 2021, the world has gone digital and paper marketing collateral has been replaced by QR codes and social media. In addition to that, I'd just like to add, because of the funding, we've been able to subcontract with Lemon Tree Agency, and not only do we, does Placer Grown itself have a robust social media presence, but we're kind of working ourselves out of a job because one of the things that Patrick's doing very effectively is getting our farmers trained up and they're independent and they're producing their own content. Um, and I don't know if it gets much better than that because now we just, it's, it's leveraging marketing and uh, it's a great addition. The other thing is print ads have become prohibitively expensive and they have a steadily decreasing audience. And that's an important thing. I think back in the day in 2001, the marketing program could act as the agent for the farmers because they couldn't afford to each take out an ad. So Placer Grown could take out an ad. Now, nobody's doing it. It's, it, it just doesn't work anymore for us, for our industry. So um, goal three in 2001 was to develop contacts with the media. This is still a key goal. We had over 20 live tw television spots last year. Um, goal four in 2001 was to enhance the Placer Grown website. In the ensuing 20 years, the website has been completely revised three times and will undergo its fourth major revision this year. Um, goal five and goal six kind of go together. They were to develop retail outlets and create demand for local produce at local restaurants and to identify barriers to agricultural endeavors in the county. And that sat with the marketing program, right? That's where those, those goals were put is in that contract. And the thing that's um, happened over the years is we've discovered that farmers are their own best advocates. Um, it doesn't help to have a middleman in there. It helps for the farmer to develop the relationship with the restaurant and also just the logistics. It's like if I go to a restaurant and say, hey, do you want some turnips? And then I go to the farmer and say, hey, they want your turnips. And they say, when do you want me to deliver them? And, and it's like, no. That, do, that doesn't work any, anymore either. And as far as identifying barriers, we have a much better system now. Josh acts as the um, agent to help the farmers. He's the person who's the most knowledgeable. He knows the county. So all the growers have access to their ag commissioner, and they can just say, hey, I'm struggling with something with planning, or I'm struggling with environmental health, or whatever it is, and Josh can help. And that, I think that's a much smoother path. Um, so these are a few examples of how the agricultural marketing program has changed over the years and how your support has allowed us to change with the times and help our farmers become more self-sufficient. Having a robust marketing effort has helped agriculture to continue to grow in Placer County. And again, we thank you sincerely for your support of the program and of our farmers, ranchers, vintners, and brewers. Now, now we have a little yeah. video to share with you. All right. Should have sound. To bring you another point of view. There we go. The COVID pandemic has had a historical impact on society that will be written about for decades to come. These impacts are generally viewed as negative. However, one silver lining was the positive impact on our local agricultural industry. By July of 2020, the initial shock of the pandemic and resulting quarantines had morphed into a more endemic situation. As remote work, distance learning, and stay-at-home orders solidified, 
many became concerned about the availability and the security of their food supply. Desperate for a source of human interaction and worried, consumers started to rethink their views and the importance of a diverse local food supply. In the midst of all this uncertainty, our farmers kept farming. Considering these new dynamics, the Placer Grown Ag Marketing Program was able to utilize our existing infrastructure and relationships to quickly adapt and implement marketing efforts that accounted for shifts in consumer demand. Although we were unable to support promotional events such as the Farm and Barn Tour, through our website and social media, consumers were able to find local sources of food and safer places to shop, such as our outdoor farmer's markets. Here are some examples of our agricultural marketing efforts over the last year. We provided lunches for the Placer Nature Center summer camp. With a change in delivery method, our successful in-person crop to tabletop dinner became a takeout dinner with Josephine's Restaurant. Despite this change, Placer Grown sold over 100 meals in 24 hours. Seven online cooking demonstrations were recorded in partnership with local chefs to promote seasonal agricultural products. Key growers reported at least a 20% increase in sales. As case studies, Placer Grown monitored four new farms that appear to have reached a point of long-term viability. Placer Grown continues to witness an increase in the number of local farm stands. However, the story for our wineries and breweries was not so positive as many suffered real financial hardship. Based on restaurant and bar restrictions, our wineries were unable to conduct their normal tasting room activities. Placer Grown responded by utilizing our social media and PR resources to provide much needed promotion of curbside sales and other activities. Social media and PR remain a cornerstone of our program. We secured over 20 live TV interviews and social media efforts resulted in almost 1,050,000 organic impressions and a combined 29,171 followers on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Another overlooked but positive result of the chaos of 2020 through 2021 was the increased strength and support by the farming community for the farming community. Farmers were working together to address COVID challenges and farmers supported one of their own who suffered a devastating fire and showed a renewed interest in working cooperatively. Placer Grown remains committed to the continued effort of fostering this spirit of cooperation in our agricultural community. It's truly an honor to serve Placer County farmers and ranchers, and we look forward to what the new year will bring. Any questions? Oh, thanks, Carol. Thank you. Great video and great presentation, Josh and Carol. Um, Jim, you had a question or comment? Oh, just comment. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. And it's exciting to see agriculture grow and prosper in Placer County. Uh, uh, later this week, I'll be going down to Monterey uh, for a conference, and I'm taking a basket uh, of uh, you know, local products to share with the people in you know, some of the other counties. And I want to thank you for the fruit crate that you brought for us. And um, Beverly will be mad at me if I don't ask you to go take a look at it before we go, before I leave for. Okay. Uh, and then uh, in you know the 20th year of Placer Grown, would never have happened without Joanne Neft. She's the one that planted the seeds, kept watering us, kept prodding us, kept coming to the board and working with uh, farmers that may not even wanted to be part of it, but she talked them into, and this is the result of what we've been able to do. And it's just because of her uh, that I've lost weight, actually, because she told me what I needed to, <laughs> what I needed to eat <laughs> instead of going to the fast food places. And, but uh, really, uh, uh, I, you just have to, uh, she needs to have her own statue uh, out in the farmer's market somewhere. Uh, so anyhow, I just wanted to point that out. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? 
Thumbs up. Great job. Okay. Well, we have a proclamation. Um, I'm going to read, and then we'll ask for a motion, and we'll also take any public comment on this matter. Um, so, in the matter of a proclamation recognizing October 2021 as Celebrate Placer Ground Month in Placer County, whereas Placer County has been farmed to fork since 1849 when its early settlers discovered the agricultural gold that could be produced utilizing the county's rich soils, pure water, and perfect growing climate. And whereas Placer County is experiencing agricultural resurgence as many discover the rich potential that exists here. And whereas Placer County's general plan places high importance on the preservation of agricultural land and the economic viability of agriculture. And whereas 2021 marks the 20th anniversary of the county's Placer Grown Agricultural Marketing Program. And whereas Placer County is home to a growing and thriving farm-based winery and brewery industry. And whereas Placer County's mandarins are celebrated far and wide for their beautiful color and superior flavor. And Whereas Placer County's farmers, market, farmers markets and farm stands represent a unique opportunity for our residents to purchase the highest quality locally grown produce directly from the farmer. And whereas Placer County agriculture is a growing industry with exciting new investments being made on a frequent basis. And whereas the Placer County Board of Supervisors encourages all citizens to support our local farmers and ranchers throughout the designated month and beyond by purchasing locally grown agricultural products. Now therefore be it proclaimed that the above proclamation hopefully will be duly passed by the Board of Supervisors <laughs> of Placer Co County of Placer on behalf of the citizens of Placer County at a regular meeting held September 28, 2021. So with that, do I have a motion? Second. Thank you. Um, and do we need to do a roll call with a proclamation, or is that? No, but we do need to take public comment. Oh, we do need to take public comment. I'm so sorry. Is there anyone from the public who would like to comment on either of the reports or on our wonderful proclamation? Mm hmm And we have one room, so that's fine. Okay. <laughs> hey, man. Uh, Rob Haswell, 11075 Oakview Terrace, Auburn. Uh, also, the executive director CEO of Placer County Visitors Bureau. I uh, just wanted to take a minute here to really uh, reemphasize that partnership, what, uh, what Patrick uh, said about us earlier. One of the things about um, the work that Placer Grown is doing is it's not, it hasn't really just been a, been a real boon for our uh, farming community, but it's really started to uh, evolve our entire culinary uh, experience here. Um, there's been a lot of cooperation. Uh, the whole farm to tabletop, uh, you know, movement has really become, you know, something that Placer can be super proud of. It's, we're not, uh, you know, Sacramento has self-proclaimed themselves the farm to fork capital, but uh, I always say you're getting all the food from Placer and YOLO. Uh, but now we're also doing the restaurants, uh, the wineries, you know, uh, all of this stuff. And that's really, I think, due to the work that, that these folks are doing. And um, just really want to reiterate how important that is to the quality of life that we all share here. Um, and also want to let Supervisor Holmes, it, it is worth noting with my history that my great-great-grandfather, Frederick Birdsell, yeah. actually um, built the Bear Ditch River, uh, Bear Ditch, Bear River Ditch Company to, dis to uh, bring water down to the Loomis Basin in the 1870s. So yeah, yeah. Eh, a little history there for me. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, really, this is a great organization. Thank you. thank you, Rob. Any other public here in the room? Okay, we have one Zoom caller. We have two now. Oh, two Zoom callers now. Cheryl, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, good morning. Uh, congratulations to the uh, ag community. I actually do farm myself. I grow heirloom seeds and believe in um, producing what I eat as much as possible. Uh, a couple quick comments I, I had were on the um, crops such as almonds, which are heavy water producers. I would um, ask the commissioner if maybe he could um, 
consider uh, looking at other alternatives. I, I think there are other ways to do that. Um, farm to table, I think, is very big, as is a um, culinary. I, I congratulate um, the county for doing that. My concern, one of my concerns has been with the, the I'll call it Disney-esque um, treatment of wineries and breweries. I, I think everyone loves wineries and breweries, but along with that comes the um, the vehicle miles travel, the noise, and it's not the wineries and breweries, it's the event centers. And so I'm hoping that the commissioner can work um, closer with the community to understand where these issues are, because I think that the community as a whole really supports um, wineries and breweries, but we are in the top 10 in the Sacramento and Roseville area for poor air quality in the United States. And so thinking about how you can grow along with um, managing that aspect would be great. And, and again, congratulations on your um, 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And next caller. Kathleen, Kathleen please unmute your mic and give your comments. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Board of Supervisors. I want to speak in favor of this um, proclamation, but I also want to urge the county to look very carefully at planning um, and the planning commission and development issues in the county, which are encroaching all the time on our agricultural and open space. And I think the county has uh, not done as good a job as it could do to protect the agricultural interests and the open space interests in our area. So please um, keep that in mind. Um, I do appreciate all the work that's being done by Placer Grown, and I think that this is an important aspect for us to add to um, our diverse economic base, not just tourism, but agricultural and um, other small businesses. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And I don't know if either one of you want to respond to any questions from the public that were you came up to the mic, so I didn't oh, know. Oh, no, I'm just, I was just li trying to listen carefully to okay. what you were saying. Great, yeah. great. A uh, pleasure grown just, you know, as part of our 501c3, we do not get involved in anything political. We can't. And so space use and all that, that belongs somewhere else, not with us. Great. That's all I can say about that. Okay, thank you. So with that, we have a motion and a second on this proclamation. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, seeing none, we'll present. Thank you so much for your reports today. And I think we want to get a picture. And I'm going to stand in for Rob. Do you want all of us up there? Or? Oh, go ahead. Do it. Okay. I'm going to stand in for Robert here. Okay. glasses off. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. I know. Let me know if I don't. Okay. Great. We'll move on now to our item three on our agenda. Gosh, we're only to number three. <laughs> this is Placer Vineyard Specific Plan Property 1B Specific Plan Amendment Development Agreement Amendment. Well, good morning, Supervisors. My name is Callie Kedinger Cecil with the Planning Services Division. This morning, I am requesting that this item be continued to the October 12th agenda uh, to a time that I would work out with uh, Clerk of the Board, Megan Wood. Chair, we okay. would request that the item be moved to October 12th um, at 9 a.m. or as soon thereafter as possible. 9 a.m. or soon thereafter, depending on public comment that day, right? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, do you need a motion? Yes, but I think we I'll, need a motion. I'll move that we do the requested action. Second. Thank you both. And um, Supervisor Jones is temporarily out, so I'll um, just do a roll call for this then. And just a, okay. 
All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. That catches us up a little bit on time, making me look a little better. Then we'll move on to our 1045 timed item, number four, county executive. This is a capital facilities impact fee, annual report, and consumer price index adjustment. Yes, good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Vanessa Lieberman, and I'm a management analyst in your CEO's office. The item before you today is to adopt a resolution to accept the Placer County Capital Facilities Impact Fee Annual Report and make findings as required by Government Code 66000, and to make the annual fee adjustment as required by County Code. The Capital Facilities Impact Fee Annual Report is required by County Code to identify the amount of fees collected and used for capital projects needed to serve new development and includes findings required by Government Code 66000. The total amount of fees collected for fiscal year 2020-2021 was $8.2 million. The beginning balance as of July 1, 2020 was $19.9 million. After the final coroner payment of $3.5 million and other contributions, our ending balance is $21.2 million as of June 30, 2021. Also included in the annual report is an updated fee schedule adjusted by consumer price index for all urban consumers. The time period utilized was from June 2020 through June of 2021, and the fee increase for this year is 4.428%. The updated fee will go into effect 60 days after your board's approval of the annual report and the updated fee schedule. The Capital Facilities Impact Fee Annual Report was made available to the public 15 days prior to today's board meeting for review and all outreach was done with our city partners and the BIA. This concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Do we have any questions? Okay, any public comment on this item? Here I see none. I'm not seeing any public comment. Sorry, Suzanne, did you have any questions on the facilities fee. Okay, uh, then I'd entertain a motion. I'll second. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Hi, Carrie. We're on to Agricultural Commission use of funds and reimbursement agreement with Placer County Water Agency. And Carrie Timmer is presenting this. Good morning, uh, Vice Chair Gustafson and members of the board. Carrie Timmer here, the Regional Forest Health Coordinator, with what I hope will be a fairly simple request of your board, and that is, in essence, to allow me to spend $1 million of somebody else's money. Um, this funding would be used to continue wildfire fuel reduction and forest health work on the French Meadows Restoration Project. So to give you just a brief bit of background, um, our partner, the Placer County Water Agency, or PCWA, was recently awarded $1 million from the Sierra Nevada Conservancy as part of a competitive early action forest resilience funding distribution that took place earlier this summer. The award is intended to cover work to reduce tree density and fuels on almost 500 acres in the upper watershed areas that are feeding French Meadows Reservoir and our Middle Fork power system. Um, the county currently holds a master stewardship agreement with the U.S. Forest Service which allows us to oversee the program of work in the field for this joint project that we have with the county, the water agency, and a number of other partners. Um, and as a result, Placer County Water Agency, the recipient of this new funding, has requested that we, the county, uh, manage the work that will be conducted under this grant as well. So the proposed use of funds and reimbursement agreement before you today would codify that relationship which would allow the county to handle procurement, contract management, invoicing, vendor payments, and reporting for the grant, implementation of the work on the ground across the almost 500 acres included in this project, and then coordination between the partners and the key agencies involved. And these are all services that we are currently providing for other funding sources and partners. Um, the county would then be reimbursed by Placer County Water Agency for the expenses that are incurred on behalf of the project using the grant funding that is coming from the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. 
So the use of funds and reimbursement agreement would start immediately upon approval of your board, a review as to form by county council, and signature by the Ag Commissioner Sealer. This agreement would continue through December 31st of 2024, or the completion of the project work, whichever comes first. We are definitely hoping that the work would be completed well in advance of that date. We're hoping by the end of next year, 2022, uh, but that will depend largely on weather conditions and fire conditions and things that often have restrictions in terms of how much work can get accomplished in the season. The actual cost of the anticipated work is roughly $2 million in total. So the remaining funding, plus you, you might notice this clause in the grant agreement, um, if the Sierra Nevada Conservancy were to deny payment of any certain expenses that Placer County would be invoicing, sorry, Placer County Water Agency, would be invoicing them for um, then the funds that are currently involved in the French Meadows project outside of this grant funding would be used to make up that difference, both for the remaining project work as well as, again, any of these costs that for whatever reason might be denied by the ultimate funder. Uh, to move this work forward then, staff recommends that your board first approve and authorize the Ag Commissioner Sealer to execute this $1 million use of funds and reimbursement agreement with our partner, Placer County Water Agency. Uh, and that would be the vehicle to establish the relationship that will allow the County Office of the Ag Commissioner Sealer to manage implementation of the Sierra Nevada Conservancy grant activities on behalf of Placer County Water Agency under the county's U.S. Forest Service Master Stewardship Agreement. And then secondly, to approve a fiscal year 21-22 budget amendment, number 00553, for community and agency support to allow for the payments that will then be reimbursed to the county from Placer County Water Agency, meaning that ultimately there is no net fiscal impact to the county. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I have a question. Sorry. Yes, Bonnie uh, first, then Jim. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate it. And you know, there's been so much work done in that area to protect the reservoir, to protect the watershed. It's been a, it's been a terrific effort. Uh, how much more? Like, how many more acres do we anticipate still need to be addressed uh, to keep that area safe? So, based on the original proposal design. Uh, we have roughly 5,600 acres remaining to be treated overall. We intend, we hope, to have about 1,000 of those acres treated by the end of this field season, so that would leave us with about 4,600 acres. And how much have we done, done up to this point? We have done, um, unfortunately, less than we would have liked. We were planning or hoping originally to, to be able to treat roughly 3,000 acres per season. And so far, we've treated about 3,000 acres over two and a half seasons. Okay. Um, this year, just as an example, um, this gets into some uh, detailed um, planning and processing by the US Forest Service. But historically speaking, say for the month of June, there might have been two or three days where our vendors were not allowed to work. This year, it's been more like 16 because of the weather conditions. Because of the weather conditions and the extreme fire danger. And part of that is because the firefighting capacity is being used elsewhere and therefore would not be available should there be a start, a fire start, as a result of this work or really anywhere in the forest. Um, and as you might recall, the, the nine uh, national forests were shut down for a period of time. And that was for this very reason, is that they did not have the firefighting capacity on hand to be able to deal with something if it were to start. Thank you. That's very helpful. Certainly. Great. Jim? Yeah, thank you, Carrie. Uh, who, who's going to be managing the use of these funds? And, uh, the, yeah, me. I, I just wanted to. Yes, me with, with great support from my boss, Josh, whom you just heard from, and all of the partners. But yes, that will fall under my... All right, well, I'm, I'm going to move that we do this because we got to keep moving, uh, especially if we ever get any snow, we want to get as much work done. I am so conflicted. I hate this position I'm in where I so badly want snow, and yet I'm so desperately <laughs> afraid of getting snow. <laughs> I, know. I think I heard a motion. Do we have a... I'll, I'll second it. Okay, then we need to go to public comment. Are there any members of the public who wish to address this item? not seen any um, so we have a motion and a second and I think the second part requires a roll call but not this 
One motion with the roll call. Okay, so you've moved approval on both item one and two, the agreement and the budget amendment. And we'll do roll call. Gord? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate and I guess my rough calc is we need about 16 million more to finish up the scope of work. And I. Keep working on it. Yeah, keep working on it. <laughs> Thank you. Great. We'll move on then to item six, our facilities management, uh, building 301 improvements project. Hope, is she here with us? She's on Zoom. Good morning, Madam Vice Chair and members of the board. My name is Hope Bostick and I'm an architect with facilities management, capital improvements division. And I'm here today to make two requests associated with the improvements to building 301 at the Placer County Government Center for the Agricultural Department Weights and Measures Division. So again, this is part of Josh's work. Um, so first, I'd like to request authorization for the Director of Facilities Management to execute a job order authorization for $295,270 with Mesa Energy Systems, which will exceed the $250,000 individual job order limit under the job order contract agreement. Um, and, and this would be for building 301 improvements for project for the agricultural weights and measures division and to authorize needed change orders not to exceed $27,264 consistent with the county purchasing manual and the public contract code. Secondly, I would like to um, request that you authorize the procurement manager to amend the job order contract or JOC um, contract number SCN 102955 with Mesa Energy Systems, which will exceed the JOC aggregate limit of $1 million by $400,000. This will allow for the construction of the building 301 improvements as part of Mesa's work as well as other pending work anticipated to be completed by Mesa Energy Systems Inc. during the current contract period, which is about to expire. Um, but all of this work has already been occurred and we've already gotten proposals for this work from Mesa. Any questions? Are there any questions? Not seen any, any public comment on this item. We're not seeing any public comment, hands raised, so we'll uh, entertain a motion. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you very much, Hope. Thank you. We'll move on to Health and Human Services item, a number of items that Amy and then Dr. Oldham will be talking about. First item A. Good morning, uh, Vice Chair Gustafson and members of the board. I am Amy Ellis, the Director of the Adult System of Care, here with five action items for your board's consideration. First, to an, approve an amendment to contract with Roseville Hospitality LLC, doing business as Ham Hampton Inn and Suites, Roseville of San Francisco, San Francisco, California, for emergency lodging services for a maximum increase of $754,929, for a new maximum amount of $4,042,570 through December 31st, 2021, to extend the term and increase capacity as needed for increased COVID-19 risk subject to available funding. Second, to approve an option to extend the contract with Roseville Hospitality LLC doing business as Hampton Inn and Suites, Roseville of San Francisco, California, on an as-needed as basis through March 31st, 2022, for a maximum increase of $754,929, for a new maximum amount of $4,797,499, subject to available funding. Third, to approve an extension to a contract with Yanni King of California, Inc. of Sacramento, California for cleaning services at the Hampton Inn & Suites through December 31st, 2021, 
Fourth, to approve an option to extend the contract with Yanni King of California Incorporated of Sacramento, California for cleaning services at the Hampton Inn and Suites through March 31st, 2022. And fifth, to authorize the purchasing manager to sign all required documents. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, counties were asked to find and provide non-congregate sheltering for residents of Placer County who became COVID positive, exposed, or who are at higher risk of complications if they were to contract COVID-19. The use of hotel facilities for housing these persons provides this separation in a safe and secure environment, which is essential to prevent or slow the spread of the virus throughout the community. The only hotel in the Roseville area that was willing to work with the county for these lodging services is Hampton Inn and Suites in Roseville. We have been operating Project Room Key here since spring of 2020. As we continue to see COVID-19 cases in Placer County, including with this at-risk population, it is necessary to continue utilizing the Hampton Inn to keep individuals isolated. Therefore, it's necessary to extend the agreement through December 31st, 2021. The agreement for cleaning services will also need to be extended accordingly. In the event of additional services are needed beyond December 31st, the lodging and cleaning services may be extended on a month to month basis as needed through March 31st, 2022. Both of the agreements include options to cancel with 30 days notice. County staff will closely monitor the needs for these service and reduce the contracts with, the, with them as necessary. While utilization varies week to week, we have seen high utilization of this service over the last two months. Um, last week, we only had one room available. Intakes for this program occur every, every weekday. 76 individuals have been housed, um, have been housed, permanently housed, or put placed into housing at exit from the program. The total cost of this increase is related to COVID-19 homeless mitigation and is expected to be covered by Project Room Key, FEMA, Epidemiology Laboratory Capacity Grant, and an existing allocation of general fund in lieu of CARES Act funding. Any funds to be reimbursed by FEMA, um, any funds to be reimbursed by FEMA will need to be advanced from the County General Fund. If funding does not become available from FEMA, then County General Funds will, will not be reimbursed. Happy to answer any questions on this item. Thank you, Amy. Any questions for Amy? Bonnie? Yes, thank you, Amy. I do have a question. And since we've been at this for a year, uh, I'm guessing that the funding strategy has been the same, right? And have we been reimbursed um, completely from the, the state? Have we had to take general fund dollars for this item to this point? Yeah, no, um, to this point we have not had to take general fund items. We have had some challenges to be, to be honest about the FEMA dollars and reimbursements, but luckily we have had other coronavirus related funding that I mentioned that's been able to cover the costs up to this point. Uh, moving forward, that, that might not be available and we would have to reconsider, um, reconsider continuing at that point and ask seek board's um, approval to continue if we run out of funding. Great, thank you. Suzanne? Hi, um, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just um, curious this seems kind of pricey. It runs about the 754,000 um, through December uh, 31st is about $251,000 a month, right? And how many people did you say that it it? How it serves um, roughly at any given time. Um, we didn't have every single room utilized until this iteration of the contract, so it was roughly around 65 to 68 people at any given time. But this new extension actually is going, that's why it's an additional funding. Mm -hmm. It's going to give us um, ability to use all 85 rooms, which we do in, believe that need exists to fill it. So at the capacity we had prior, we were utilizing it with about one to three vacancies. And we have to always have some vacancy for cleaning and sterilization between, between admits, but, um, but it's fully utilized at that level. And so this iteration will give us 85 rooms. How do you determine who's gonna be housed there? It's determined based, they have to be Placer County residents. They have to be homeless, uh, people without access to non-congregate living situations. And then they have to either have COVID, have been known to be exposed to somebody with COVID, 
or have medical conditions that would make them a higher risk if they were to contract COVID-19 mm -hmm. to end in the, to land in the hospital. So we take a lot of referrals from hospital discharges, from other facilities that offer services that, that those individuals ended up uh, COVID positive and there's nowhere else to, to put them. And so we take them um, from, I and mean, we have self referrals as well. Okay, and do you have a, how's the transition? How long does, do they typically stay? So their lengths of stay are a maximum of 21 days uh, because it's meant to be short term, you know, isolative. They can be readmitted um, after that 21 day period that you, there's usually a week in between before readmittance is considered and it depends on if they meet that criteria because of a, um, a medical condition that would, would make them eligible. Okay, great, thank you. And I'm gonna yes, follow up on yeah. your question. So it looks like based on the calculations, it's about an average daily rate that we, we are paying to the hotel for the services. Yeah, so because when we first made this agreement, we had a reduced rate and didn't need to pay for all of the rooms because hotels weren't doing well at the time. It was in the middle of COVID-19 pandemic. But our relationship with the hotel owner has required us to uh, increase our rates because if he were to let this agreement with us go, he could more fully utilize his hotel for hospitality and through for, through other means and so at this new one is going to have us be paying the $85 rate per room which is still a reduced rate but near you know every all 85 rooms at $85 per night thank you any other questions okay any public comment on this item I think there's a few Amy Jacqueline from Newcastle. Um, so I have, I'm a little bit concerned about this, obviously taking more money out of our budget to spend on this when we have our sheriff's department that, you know, we're being, reducing their um, compensation. Um, but are there any other resources, any other buildings that wouldn't cost, I mean, $85 per night just for the hotel? I don't even know what the cleaning, she didn't um, you know, let us know what the cleaning cost was for that, because um, that's in addition to the additional 740 whatever thousand dollars it was. Um, so are there any other resources in Placer County where these homeless, um, COVID positive, now COVID positive, obviously is a completely different story. How are they identifying? Is it just a PCR test? Do they have any symptoms? Are they struggling to breathe? You know, all of that. So are there any other resources in Placer County where they can be housed? You know, that's not a large number of people for that, you know, exorbitant amount of money. Seems like there would be some other place um, that wouldn't cost so much to house the people, and then what is the additional budget amount for the sanitation services? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Catherine McBride. And this is my friend Becky. Um, we're both Placer County residents. Um, well, first I wanted to say I'm opposed to voting on this Agenda 7 as it applies to Project Room Key which is tied to FEMA camps. I urge you to look further into this matter prior to voting on spending millions on hotels and clean, cleaning to provide for the homeless in an attempt to force social distancing as it relates to COVID-19. All of this spending is assuming there is proof that the homeless are at severe risk for con contracting COVID and that social distancing and quarantine those that aren't ill will spread, prevent the spread. There are so many schools of thought on this issue and it's not prudent to assume that the narrative being told is the actual truth. Okay. First, I don't believe the homeless really want these hotel rooms. This is my, my ex personal experience. My son was homeless in Davis and never got COVID. His homeless friends did not want to go to those hotels being provided be mainly because of the curfews. And I feel that homeless people are human beings and they deserve dignity and freedom. I don't believe they're at a high risk for COVID. 
there are studies showing the are there studies showing the rates of death from COVID in the homeless? From what I've heard, they're, they are testing the people at the shelters and those who are testing positive aren't even sick, or if they are, it's mild. So they're putting, and also they're putting the positive negative tested people together. So even if the tests are accurate, they're not being treated or quarantined correctly. By now, I bet the majority of the homeless populations already had COVID or fought it off with their own immune systems as I did in February of 2020. Okay, also those who are sick with COVID deserve to have access to early treatment such as hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin that have been proven to be safe and effective. This would be better use of the allocated COVID monies. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Um, currently we're looking at COVID variants such as Delta. How do we know Oh, did you want to speak? Um, yeah, have I was in this shelter here in Auburn. The people being tested for COVID, I don't know if those tests are even correct because they seem to be healthy if they're coming back uh, uh, as positive. I don't know anybody in there that's uh, been deathly ill and they're being sent to the hotels and they're telling me, but I didn't get sick. So I don't know, I just know of three people that were sick, but it was very mild. So I don't think it's worth sending them to the hotels when they could get this medication. I know my doctor will not give it to me. He wants me to get the, the, the uh, vax and I will not do it. The people in there that were vaxxed, they're now getting it and they're spreading. So I'm confused too on this, I'm torn. <laughs> Right. So we ask that you continue this item until the next meeting to get more yeah. information because okay. there's too many questions. Thank too you. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Thank you. Hello, Wendy Beal again. Um, I would have to agree with the, our, my fellow Placer County residents that just spoke. Um, this is a lot of money and I would love to see in um, more of a constructive way how this money is being appropriated for this for this particular um, for the homeless and also opposed to this being voted on today I think that there needs to be a lot more research um, agreed that I would love to see and with Dr. Oldham on the line um, would really love to know how he can help these people in a way let's get this money and start giving these people therapeutics if that's what um, can help them putting them in a hotel isn't going to help them if they have COVID if they are elderly and um, they are more of a high risk we need to get them therapeutics we are unnecessarily letting these people suffer we are unnecessarily letting these people die and so i would like to see more information as to the breakdown of the cleaning all of the things i worked in the hospitality industry for years 15 years 85 dollars a night per room that may not seem like a lot um, but it is for this area and um, it's just concerning that these funds are you know four million dollars it's a lot of money and would love to see you know maybe this can get continued and there can be more of a comprehensive um, detailed spreadsheet of where this money is going also the money that's been spent would love to see where the money has been spent, how that's been um, spread out. Would also like to know how, again, how and who is um, taking these individuals and looking at them and saying, you get to go, you don't get to go. Who's doing that? Where is that coming from? Just too many questions and too much information that is not um, being shared today. So as a citizen, I oppose this being voted on today. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. It's Alder Vegan. Um, so CalWorks is already providing, you know, support for housing. 
you say you have to be a Placer County resident. Well, how do you know that if they're homeless? And also, I'm sure we can see all over that our, I mean, our country is looking like a third world country, basically. And this is just gonna make it worse. The money I saw was eight billion from FEMA going to Pro Project Room Key, which I'm pretty sure you could put filtration systems and it's supposed to kill all those viruses. Why don't we just implement more money into things that are more strategic instead of trying to make our country go down into a third world country as we have been doing. Our money should be allocated and should be distributed properly and invested into things that are going to make this work out better for everybody instead of making it worse and isolating them for 14 days, 20 days. However, this is our tax dollars. I don't understand why this is even something we're even talking about. It should just not happen. I don't even know what else to say. I need to do more of my homework on this, but it's obvious that this is not a good idea. Thank you. Hi, uh, Jennifer, a resident of Placer County. I would be really curious to know what comparables we have on different buildings in the area to know why we've chosen this specific location um, to see if we could do this more cost effectively. I'd also like to know what or how um, the individuals are being treated if they are um, being forced to stay and or forced to go if they don't have um, the ability to choose. Um, I'd like to know what their rights are in this program as well. Um, I've been really following what's happening all around the world and seeing how people's rights are being um, taken away by the government choosing where you go to stay. So I would really like to know um, that they're being treated as sovereign individuals um, with the right to choose to go there or have a different plan if they choose to go. Um, also, again, just the financial aspect of this, um, I, I can't say 100%, but a lot of times when there's government contracts, places will charge more because they feel like they can. So I really do think it is important to look at um, how we're being charged, because I know you guys are very conscientious about where our money is going. Um, I know that's a really big, important point for you guys, which I really appreciate. I do think they should be treated um, with the utmost dignity and respect and given the best place to go. And so I just want to make sure that that research has been done um, before we decide to approve um, a lot of money. If it is, then so be it. That's the way we should do it. But I don't know if that has been presented to the board. And, and been looked at thoroughly. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead. And then we have two callers on Zoom that want to speak with us. Hello, Yvette Horn, as stated earlier. Um, just a few quick comments. Um, I concerned about the data based on the PCR test. The PCR test was um, announced by the CDC July 21st of this year um, to all the laboratories that it's flawed because it cannot tell the difference between the common cold the flu or COVID-19. So the current PCR test that we're using to determine all these cases, um, if it's flawed, it can't tell the difference, how do we know that the numbers are accurate? Um, the testing is going to continue to be used through the end of this year, and then new testing is gonna be rolled out January 1st. So um, flawed testing not only affects this issue, but it affects issues throughout the whole entire state and the country, um, including kids in school. Um, I'd like to know um, from Dr. Oldham, you know, if he could comment on the PCR test and whether it's accurate or not. And where's the 21-day quarantining coming from? Because it's my understanding, and I could be mistaken, but I thought it was 14 days for quarantining, so I'd like to know where that number's coming from. Um, as a citizen, citizen um, I'm opposed because it seems like an extraordinary amount of money if it's based off of potentially flawed testing, and uh, I just think we need more data. We need more information. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our Zoom callers now. 
Michael, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm opposed to this. Um, this COVID, all the all the data that the health officers and the government is pushing on COVID is fraudulent. There's there's uh, therapeutics that easily treat COVID, uh, ivermectin, uh, hydrochloroquine, for example, and that's that's. Uh, and, and we also know that the pharmaceuticals are refusing to uh, refill certain uh, hydrochloroquine prescriptions. Um, it's a lot of money. Uh, quarantine for 21 days. It just looks, looks like they're using taxpayers' money to um, quarantine these homeless people to make it look like COVID is more um, deadly than it really is when it when it's easily treatable. Thank you. No further commenters. Okay, we drop one there. Okay, Amy, do you want to come back up? There might be a couple questions you want to address or clarify from the public. Sure, I, I wrote down a few of them that I could comment on, and then if there's any others you want me to address, let me know. But um, the 21 day rule, so. So that one is a good point. I think that not only is it for isolation and quarantine, you're going to find in the next item that we're also tasked to try to work with these individuals, provide short-term case management and linkage to other housing opportunities. So the 21 days allows us to work with those individuals. It's a maximum too. Not all of them stay that period of time, but we also try to work with them on exit strategy. So we're not exiting them back into the streets and back into homelessness. So. So a follow up on that, have you been able to do that with a number of folks who have been housed there? Yeah, so, oh, sorry, that was loud. Um, <laughs> yeah, we have successfully been able to, sorry, I have that data right here. We have been able to house 76 individuals who of 30, 385 total who have exited. So the others we're continuing to work with and case manage and some of them might re-enter and then we continue to try. And then in the next item, you're gonna see some additional resources we're gonna be able to have at our disposal in order to increase that percentage. Great. Another qu uh, question about the rights to leave and whether it's voluntary, it, it absolutely is a voluntary program. Um, we encourage them to stay and educate, provide a lot of education about you know, risk and, you know, if they choose to leave, we send them out with, you know, masks and other strategies and tools to try to, again, mitigate that risk of spread throughout the community, but we do not force them to stay. Um, and then somebody else asked about how are we not just exposing everyone if we're mixing COVID positive? So we don't. Um, we have one of the floors is only for COVID positive and exposed, and we have very uh, strict protocols about how to uh, do the cleaning and the separation of any staff and um, how they do PPE and all of that. It's very, very uh, regimented to not have anyone else exposed to a COVID individual and the rest are on different floors of the hotel. And those were the main ones I captured. Is there any others that you'd like me to address? Yeah, someone mentioned uh, uh, other buildings, other resources to house these oh, folks. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, we did. I, I mean, I think some of you are aware of the exhaustive search that we made um, in order to find a hotel partner that would be willing to work with us. And in fact, um, even when the numbers lowered over the summer, um, we looked again for smaller options um, for, you know, for different facilities. It's very, this was the only hotel willing to work with us for this purpose. Um, which is why, and the owner actually has been very reasonable in working with us around rates. We do uh, pay for the, the cleaning service. We can provide a breakdown of those costs at a future date if you guys are want, would like that. Um, and we do provide food for, for those who are in the isolation and quarantine, which is, is part of the overall costs. And we track all of those costs and our revenues received. So I'm happy to provide anything to the board that you guys need on that in the future. Right. Thank you, and I see a hand raised. Public comments over, but if you have questions, you can email uh, you can email them, and we will um, provide responses to those. Because we're done with public comment at this point. Suzanne, did you have any questions? Yes, I, I do. Um, I'm just wondering. Um, you said that they come from. They're either released, you're, the people who move there, or that were allowed to go there. 
They're released from other facilities? Do you mean like hospitals? Yeah, so um, if they need, are ready to be discharged from the hospital, but they haven't finished their quarantine period or they're still showing COVID positive, that would be somebody that we would take um, jail as well. Sometimes it's time for them to be released from jail, but we know they're COVID positive, so they would work with us to try to find a place for them. Other facilities like um, SUD residential facilities or um, other mental health residential facilities, they might ask us to take them temporarily if they're COVID positive. So we work with a lot of our community partners who are trying to find resources and temporary placements for their client, their known clients who um, are are struggling in these times. Are, are they? I think that you said that 385 exited, exited, exited so, the program. Yeah, so more have been served. So let me see if I can find that. Mm -hmm. mm. So it looks like. You know, I, I don't want to say the wrong number, so I, but it's it's roughly around. Oh, it looks like four hundred and thirty-four. Mm -hmm. Might, but the total number of people. As, no, no. I, you know, actually, can I follow back up? I don't want to sure. get the wrong number. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Santa, sure, but uh, but in conjunction with you said those that are are released from hospitals or whatever, are they able to continue a med medication protocol if they're on one? Yeah, so they they have to be stable. Like we don't provide, we don't have medical professionals on site. Although um, we do work with home health, if they can exit them with a home health aide that would come in and provide some assistance while they're there. Um, but and they have to be able to be take their own medications or have a home health aide with them within the facility. Right. While they're there, are their rooms cleaned daily? No, they're no, they're they have room checks to ensure that we're not ruining the rooms for the owner, um, but they do not get daily cleaning. The cleaning is for the turnover between residents to make sure it's deep cleaned and sterilized for the next person. Okay, and then after one leaves a room and it's cleaned, do you guys go in and inspect it? Does anyone inspect the room for? Yeah, yes, they are inspected while people are still there and they are inspected afterwards. We have to ensure that we keep the, the rooms in good shape for the owner per our contract with them. Okay, and can you be more specific about project room key funds for, for everyone? Right, so, um, so project room key is a state program where these funds are provided to every county across California specifically for this purpose. So we would only be able to use these funds in this manner on this particular service. It's not that I would have the opportunity to accept the funds and then do a different strategy. We would need to use it for this specific strategy. Okay, and how? what's the outlook on that money? Do you know, is it still going to keep coming or I know you don't have yeah, to Yeah, so <laughs> it's, that's why we do things on a month to month and come back so frequently to the board with this particular item because um, there is some indeterminate, but, but, but so far it's been continuing and we expect it to continue, especially since case rates continue to be high. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, board members? I think Bonnie had also covered that no general fund dollars, no Placer County direct taxpayer dollars that we're in charge of are going to this program. It's from the state Correct. funding. Correct. I just wanted to reemphasize what that is. And, and you know, I, I, it's, it's a lot of money, and I, I want to share with these residents. I, I hear what you're saying, and um, I appreciate your concerns and the questions you're asking. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to take state dollars the state has allocated this money and allowing us to serve a population that otherwise would not be served. Um, we all know people who've gotten sick from COVID and have been very, very ill. And this is an opportunity to serve those residents that otherwise uh, would be on the streets. Um, it's their choice to come there and get that housing for a temporary um, period of time. And so I hear your concerns at the same time. We have a a responsibility to help do our part to keep residents 
um, safe and healthy where we can do that and the state's providing the dollars to do so. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and, and move the item. Second. Okay, we've been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And we'll move on to item 7B. And hey. again, Amy, you're on the... Yes, uh, this one is related but different. So good morning, Vice, uh, Vice Chair Gustafson and members of the board. Again, I'm Amy Ellis, the Director of the Adult System of Care with just one action item for your board's consideration to ratify the director's certification to accept from the California Department of Social Services the room key project and rehousing strategy allocation in its total allocated amount of $906,712 to continue the rehousing efforts for fiscal year 2021 through 2022 for Placer County's room key project. So as you've just heard, in March 2020, communities across California began operating locally driven and state supported project room key initiatives to provide this emergency non congregate shelter for people experiencing homelessness for public health related reasons associated with COVID-19. The California Department of Social Services utilized a $50 million state general fund appropriation to provide funds to counties and tribes to secure trailers, motels, and hotels to initiate and operate Project Room Key. CDSS allocated an additional $59 million in one-time state general fund in December of 2020 to support continued Project Room Key operations while increasing the focus and resources to transition participants to permanent housing. At any point in time, the project serves up to, like we just discussed, 65 guests, but it will be increasing to closer to 85 guests, single adults and families who are homeless and have one of the CDC medical risk factors that increase their risk for COVID-19. The project also provides COVID-19 positive and COVID-19 exposed individuals room to isolate and quarantine for the duration of the contagious period. Guests work with case managers on applying for permanent housing vouchers, SSI income benefits, mental health services, IHSS services, amongst others. This new allocation will be used for the guests at Project Room Key towards minimizing their barriers to homelessness rental payments, deposits, household items, application fees, hiring housing coordinators and case managers. This funding will allow staff to help house um, an even higher percentage of those who exit the program room key and avoid them returning to homelessness. Um, all revenue and associated expenditures from this agreement are provided 100% with federal and state funds with no county match required and will be budgeted appropriately. Thank you, Amy. Any questions, board members? Okay. I do. Okay. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Suzanne. I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, so you mentioned staff. Yes. And so then does this also help pay staff costs? It can. For? Yeah, it, it can. Um, so we can we can hire additional and actually offset any of the staff time that we're using towards these rehousing strategies so um we have been you know just focusing our staffing on keeping individuals sheltered this will let, allow us to go beyond that and actually try to do some long-term strategies to help them not re-enter homelessness which I mean, just, just to point out is also really useful to our city partners who the project is located in, wanting those individuals to enter homelessness and not back into the streets into homelessness. So this will help with that and ensure that as many as possible have some resources and help and the staffing support to follow them to be able to connect them to solutions for, for homelessness and not go back to the streets. So do you mean some of this money then goes to city staff no, so we'll probably likely, um, it'll go to some contracted staff and extra help staff that will be employed to work within the project as case managers in the ways mentioned to try to have them find um, long-term income strategies and places where they could rent and to do first and last month's rent to help get them started. Okay, so if we're trying to keep them from going back to homelessness, where are we housing them? 
<laughs> That's the big question. <laughs> yeah, it's it's challenging. Um, our housing coordinators try to develop relationships with landlords mm -hmm. and um, and help them understand that by helping them engage in services and having case management support that we can work with landlords to help it be a mutually beneficial arrangement to house our folks. Yeah. And so we work on those relationships to increase our housing opportunities, but we would love more. So, but they come from homelessness, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So when we move them into a place, we help pay for first and last month's rent. Did these people, they're homeless, do they have an income? Right, so we're, tr we're in addition to just first and last, we would be working with them to try to receive any benefits they're eligible, including SSI income if they're eligible, or any other types of social service um, that they qualify for. The case managers would help link them to that. And then also housing vouchers if they qualify. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of reasons a person might be able to get some subsidies towards helping them remain in housing. Okay, and do we have the manpower to follow up on these people and find out whether after their first and last month's rent, if they're able to stay or do they succeed? Do they fall back out of the system? Well, this money will help us build our manpower, but um, yes, I would say we also try to link them to ongoing case management that they might be eligible for, whether that be mental health services, our whole person care efforts, our homeless liaison team. We have many, many resources that we would try to help them link to for ongoing services and supports. Mm -hmm. But we probably don't have the, the manpower to actually follow up to find out who's successful and who isn't? Oh, um, for each person? Um, we do have some data. We do have some data. I can't answer confidently for every single person. Um, mm -hmm. Data is complicated, but I could provide some of our data about our, um, our success rates. Sure, I'd be curious if, if you could. Sure. One day. Thank you. Great, any other questions, board members? Okay, any public comment on this item? Hi, Jacqueline Hi. again. I did have a question on, um, she mentioned helping the homeless find uh, government sources like SSI and uh, resources for rent um, help through government funds, but I didn't, I. Every week I get a list, actually probably every day from Placer County of all these job opportunities available and people, and I'm a business owner, people needing um, workers in their businesses. But I, don't, I didn't hear any mention of helping the homeless find employment uh, for one thing. And, um, and then again, it just seemed like a black hole of, of money being spent for uh, not really any benefit, and it's you know my taxpayer dollars, whether it comes lo from locally, from our local budget, or from the state of California budget, uh, or the federal government budget, it's all my taxpayer dollars. So I'd, I'd like to know if they're actually helping people find employment and being useful citizens rather than um, all these government uh, sources of funding. And, and also the other thing is, um, what about, uh, these are kind of social um, problems. Um, typically those kinds of things are handled by like churches, uh, loaves and fishes, you know, uh, resources like that. Are there no longer any of those kinds of resources available for um, these people or, or are they not reaching out for those resources? Anyway, thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, Jennifer from Placer County. I, I guess I'm a little bit confused and maybe I missed something. Are we using um, COVID dollars to rehome the homeless? Is, can somebody answer that? Is that what I'm you understand? I'm making your comments and then we'll ask her to address and clarify. Okay. Um, I. Um, I, I've worked with um, people on SSI, SSDI in the past. Um, they're getting around $900 a month if they qualify for that, for room, lodging, food, 
uh, entertainment. Like that's that's their budget pretty much. Um, so one one of the things I noticed while working with this population, especially if they were mentally ill, um, sometimes they'd leave their um, homes and go missing. And I'm just not really sure how that's um, going to be affected for this program. I, I think there's a great need to help the homeless people in our community. But I, th I think it'd be really good to know, um, as Suzanne pointed out, like with the follow-up star, because we can put a lot of money forward to get somebody into a house. But if they're not capable of understanding that this is where they live because they're going in and out of a schizophrenic mm -hmm. situation or, or things like this, they will leave their home and go back to being homeless out of, for lack of a better word, pure confusion. And so I, if we are going to spend the money to do this, which is a lovely thing to do, I really do think we need to have some sort of follow-up or do less of it with, with the money budgeted for a follow-up to make sure it's successful so the tax dollars aren't just being kind of thrown out um, for unsuccessful cases. Um, I really do want to help everybody, but I think we need to kind of look at that mm -hmm. um, aspect as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Michelle Derby again. Um, I was trying to do my homework on this one. I, I mean, I. I knew some stuff about this, but it does say the funds are coming also from, uh, oh, sorry, the coronavirus package. Uh, well, sorry about that. Okay. 1.2 billion is derived from the coronavirus state fiscal recovery fund, 1.45 billion in home team funding. <clears throat> also, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, ARPA. That's 250 million in state general funds that are going to this. For some reason, on this home key um, website, it has like awards for getting people to join this program. I, I want to know why. That's weird. Um, is it more incentives to try to push the vaccine down our throat, or what is this really happening? FEMA um, is what is funding this home key grant funds for the homeless. And I think our money can be used a little bit more wisely. I don't know if anybody is familiar with concentration camps, but it sounds like that's where we're heading when I see this kind of stuff and I don't like it. So I don't know what else to say besides our money can go to something else. I know you're saying it's not taxpayer money, but let's no, it, be honest, no, it, it affects us. It affects us. Oh, we, I said Placer County. Yeah, um, so that's all. Thank you. Thanks. I know there's a lot we want to clarify, but keep coming. <laughs> Let's get all the comments in. <laughs> Hi, Wendy Beal again. A few things. Um, I don't really feel like the question was clarified in terms of other options. Um, I know. Mr. Holmes, you had mentioned and clear, questioned that again, and, and the answer was there were no other hotels in the area that wanted to work, and that there was extensive work on um, looking for other options. What other options other than hotels? Um, what other, I guess I'm kind of trying to think out of the box, like how can we, if, if truly our, um, we're wanting to help the homeless, how can we do that in a way that is more like a longer, um, more beneficial for them in terms of rehabilitation? I think mental health is a huge issue. I know um, the homeless population that, I guess digging down deeper to the root of what's causing them to be homeless. Um, I understand that this is a COVID relief, but um, is, and, and if that's how we're getting them in, but then how can we then um, look at this program in helping them, you know, get jobs and, and all of those things um, help with the mental health? Because I think if we're just putting a Band-Aid on a bullet hole, we're not really helping. We're, we're 
you know, we're just, it's just, it's not sustainable for them. Um, and I really appreciate um, Suzanne's comment and just the accountability. Um, I, I don't know your name, I'm sorry. She had mentioned um, that she has some data, but w who is accountable for this data? I think that that's super crucial, like following up with these people. You know, did this work? Are we, are we keeping any data to see, like, is, is this working? Is this going to work in the future? Are we just going to keep throwing money this way? But we don't even know if this program has worked from here, um, you know. So just those things and my thoughts, and thank you for this time. Okay, we have one on Zoom. Michael, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Sure. Um, again, it doesn't seem like the money is being accounted for. And what's how are we helping the homeless by just giving them a place to stay? We really need to rehabilitate them. And I, I, I believe that churches and, and organizations like Loaves of Fishes are, more, are better equipped than the state is to help these people. So in the long run, this is, isn't really um, helping the people by just putting them in motels. And it's really our taxpayers' money. So I believe the, that we, the people, should have a say in that as well. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Amy, I'll have you come back up. I, I did want to clarify, it's certainly uh, the funds that the state and federal government put toward these programs are taxpayer funds. It's just they are dedicated to these funding streams and not at our liberty to move them around or they directly are funds to dictate how they're shown um, done. Um, you know, I think some of this has been a misunderstanding from some of your comments. Certainly we track and try to find out effective programs. Um, homelessness is a crisis. A absolute crisis throughout this state and no one has all the answers the vast majority of these people have mental health or substance abuse problems we're trying to help them out of that um, do you want to sh shed any other light on this and and to those of you you know with a lot of questions I appreciate you wanting to understand what we can do we all need to be part of it we do work with a tremendous number of faith-based organizations and partners in the community because none of us can deal with this alone um, so i'm sorry to go on there amy and then ask oh. you if you want to address any of the other uh, sure Just, questions that yeah came. sure i a few of them so i want to say thank you for um, talking about employment piece i think that's really critical we absolutely work with uh, any individual that is capable of being hired um, to try to find employment services and we we actively work with them on that piece of it um, the ones who are deemed eligible for ssi by by the state are deemed ineligible like disabled and not able to work but anyone who is not qualifying for that then of course we would be working towards employment options for them and re-entry services and and the county offers several other programs that we could link to to continue job development and re-entry skills um, I will, yes, I'll echo what you already mentioned that we partner with lots of community-based organizations and churches. This is definite, homelessness is definitely not a county um, solution, right? I mean, it is uh, something we are engaging all of our partners on to come to the table to help to solve and to work together and to collaborate our resources. Um, the COVID, y yes, it is. Um, some of the COVID funding available, I think the, they're trying to take, just, just to clarify, to take advantage of, identify, sometimes it's hard to identify and engage these individuals. So if we can get them into the hotel, we get to know them, we can try, it's an opportunity to engage with them in a new way and try to have a bigger impact. So that is why these additional funds were, were provided to, because they re recognize the opportunity of, of more time, more ability to try to connect with them in a new way and provide some additional staffing and, and funding to be able to support that linkage into homes. Um, 
I agree with you about data. I think because so many people touch them, we have been doing a better job of um, consolidating our data into a, a single system that we all are to use. And we can, that's the system I'm speaking of that we can try to provide you guys some data, but uh, it is difficult to track because they touch many, many parts of our community um, exactly which program was responsible for their success or lack of success. But I do have some data, happy to prevent that's more general and global. And um, I think that was, that was it for the questions. I hope that is helpful. I know it's confusing and, and it's a difficult topic and a challenging situation for our community. And HHS is just trying to do their part in this, their small part in trying to address it. Thank you, Amy. Suzanne? Yeah, I just have a couple more things. So <clears throat> this is, do they call it COVID dollars? Is that what they're calling it from the state? I mean, I know it's called Project Room Key. Yeah, there's specific Project Room Key identified funds out of the total, um, the total COVID relief package, right? So then out of that, this funding that we're, we're asking can only be used on people who've touched Project Room Key. So it's a specific allocation for those folks that we've become more familiar with through this project to assist them in additional housing services. So this is a set aside money for those, in, um, those particular individuals out, out of the total COVID relief package. Okay, so this one is kind of one step beyond the last that we spoke about earlier mm -hmm. was to help those who either have COVID or test positive to help them isolate and prevent the spread of COVID. That's what the first part, yes, is it was really about sheltering, non-congregate sheltering and, and keeping them isolated. This one is to provide services and supports towards rehousing. Okay, so this is kind of the next step. Yes. yes. Okay, okay, good. Um, I just wanted to make it help to make it clear to everyone specifically what the money was for. Then I know that they've also, you know, addressed the fact that we do need to go beyond and try to solve the problem of homelessness. So I want to take this opportunity to let people know that Placer County has assembled what they call the Homelessness Task Force. It includes Placer, some supervisors as well as some city council members from each of the city councils. And the main purpose of that task force is to get to the root of homelessness and try to come and find solutions to it, permanent solutions to fixing the problem. I know it's easy to say it, it's not gonna be so easy to do, but I just want everybody to know that it's actually in the works right now. That group is meeting, and I think we also, Todd, have some, could you speak on the, the, the people that are helping out with that, the experts? Yeah, so we, you know, obviously this is a, a joint effort between, you know, there's a lot of experts in this arena from the gathering and to other um, service providers actually as a working group to identify areas where we're, and, and I'll be honest, we're doing very well in a lot of certain areas around this. I think as we talked about, we're looking at programs and services that we either can enhance or maybe reduce and re revisit some areas. So part of that effort's working group um, from a policy standpoint, I think um, the first time we've actually had all our municipal partners sitting at the table talking about this issue that's vitally important to the community um, and, and our business community as well. So. And right now it's just a manpower issue. It's all of these people working together. We're not spending any taxpayer money on it. That's correct. <laughs> okay, yep. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Supervisor Holmes. Yes, thank you. A couple, just a couple comments. Um, the homeless population, when they're out on the street, first of all, the two things that they want, they have to work on is getting something to eat and finding a place to sleep where they're safe. Uh, and they don't have enough time to kind of, they don't have any structure. So they're living on the street day to day. And we put someone in a hotel room for 14 days or 21 days, it gives them a chance for some rest, some uh, nourishment, and some time to think and get clarity with somebody helping them along that path. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes they, you know, they, some succeed, and we're very grateful for that. But there's some that just, it just doesn't work. And time you try and try. Anyhow, I just wanted to point that out. 
it's critical to get these people in some shelter so they have some kind of time to get some structure in their life. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is uh, the churches that we mentioned. The gathering in uh, before the COVID came uh, had 40 ch churches that they were taking these homeless to every night. Now they're, not, they're now down to 12 because people, the church members, are afraid that have the homeless come in who may have COVID, maybe not, but they're they're worried about it and they're not taking a chance on it. So they've decided not to help the gathering in on these homeless folks. It was a very robust pro, uh, program before COVID. Now, not so much. We have to look at other avenues. And this is one of the avenues that we can. Counties are the safety net for public health or public safety. When people fail, they come to the county for services. We try to do the best we can to provide for them. Some people don't want it. Some people fail, but there are those that succeed. So I would like to make a motion to approve this. I'll second. Thank you. Motion is second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Thank you. Item 7C, and this is an ordinance authorizing the County of Placer to join Partnership Health Plan of California Commission. Dr. Oldham is going to present on this. Great, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Gustafson and members. Rob Oldham with HHS. Here this morning uh, requesting that your board adopt an ordinance uh, introduced on the at the August 31st meeting authorizing uh, Placer County to join the Partnership Health Plan of California Commission. So this is the third and final step in the proposed transition to a county organized health system model. I know your board has heard background on this topic on multiple occasions uh, this year, but just wanted to briefly uh, summarize the background. So Placer is one of 10 counties in the region who have uh, submitted a letter of intent earlier this year to leave the current regional model of Medi-Cal managed care, a model which was chosen for us by the state uh, nearly a decade ago, uh, a model that has been demonstrated to have poor outcomes and less access to care uh, for Medi-Cal beneficiaries in multiple studies, including a 2019 state auditor report uh, requested by uh, Senator Jim Nielsen. Again, these counties, these 10 counties, and the doctors and hospitals in our counties did not have a say in this model, uh, did not have a say in the plans selected under that model, and did not have a say in the extension of the term of this model from five to 10 years. Uh, the state has finally given our counties an opportunity to have a say, albeit with a very narrow, narrow window. So our choice at, the, at this point is between staying with the existing regional model and letting the state once again uh, choose our plans for us or transitioning to a county organized health system model run by a partnership health plan a northern california not-for-profit specifically uh, created to provide medi-cal managed care services to the people and providers um, exclusively in northern california counties uh, with local governance uh, a board that's made up of local uh, providers and patients and leaders so I think we've been consistent throughout this process in saying that, at least for Placer, this recommendation to change models is not really about the plans that we are currently assigned, and, and certainly not about the, the health plan staff who've been recently assigned uh, to work with, with us here in Placer. Uh, Placer has enjoyed uh, productive working relationships with our plans, uh, especially over the last few years of this contract. So this recommendation comes down to how we can best assure the most local control uh, and the best model uh, to serve our uh, Medi-Cal beneficiaries and our uh, medi medical providers going forward. We continue to think that this is uh, the best model uh, with the uh, county organized health system model under partnership. Uh, I know some alternative models were discussed at the first reading that caused us to delay the second reading, uh, which actually gave us an opportunity to explore uh, some of those alternatives a little further. Uh, specifically, there was some discussion um, of Placer potentially teaming up with El Dorado County, who had uh, recently uh, requested to join with the health plan of San Joaquin uh, to create a regional um, health authority um, uh, that, that might also include some of the smaller uh, rural counties uh, that do not plan on moving uh, to the county organized health system model. 
However, uh, it, uh, El Dorado has appealed its case to the state, and it now appears that they have been given approval to transition to a model with uh, Health Plan of San Joaquin in 2024. Uh, there was also some discussion of Placer getting more of a voice in local governance if we were to stay with the current regional model. Of course, we would welcome such a change. Um, actually, the plans under their current uh, contract with the state are required to hold uh, local stakeholder advisory meetings, um, and uh, those haven't always happened. I know that earlier this year, uh, one of our plans has actually attempted to initiate these uh, regional stakeholder advisory meetings. Um, and while this is a welcome development, I'll point out that these meetings uh, remain more informational in, in nature, so it's not really a governance relationship. Uh, we're one of the many counties in the rural north region, including in these meetings. Um, and uh, I think the, the cadence of those meetings, uh, I think they're happening you know, two or three times a year, uh, lasting for a, a, a couple of hours, is different than what's proposed under the um, partnership health plan, uh, where the counties um, have you know, frequent, I believe, uh, every other uh, month meetings for four hours um, at, at a time that are governed, uh, you know, their votes. Um, it, it's actually public meetings under the Brown Act. Uh, so uh, while we welcome more of a voice in governance under the regional model, and we can uh, do that now, uh, we wish that we, I guess, would have been given such a voice uh, a little earlier in the contract. Uh, and uh, I guess we, we have to recognize that these recent promises of additional local voice in governance are probably uh, what we should have been getting all along. And uh, even if uh, finally realized, uh, still fall short of the level of local control uh, that we would get under a county organized health system model. So um, as I acknowledged on the, the first reading, there's still a lot of runway between now and 2024. Uh, we don't have all the details uh, worked out yet um, on either of the models, um, uh, but uh, I know there's more detail uh, coming from Partnership Health Plan, especially on the um, financial sustainability that there's a report due uh, to DHCS on, on this uh, later this month. And so we're early on in the process. Um, we continue to have strong relationships with our existing health plans under the uh, regional model. Uh, we'll continue to have open lines of communications with, with everyone. Um, so if there are any unexpected complications with the transition to a county uh, organized health system, uh, we will we'll, uh, keep, keep uh, lines of communication open and continue to um, uh, leave open the possibility of uh, other, uh, other options if, if necessary in the future. Uh, but this is an opportunity to move uh, to the county organized health system uh, that we've been waiting for uh, for a long time. Uh, we're not sure when we'll have this opportunity again, and uh, we uh, continue to recommend that we take it while we have the chance. Uh, so with that, happy to answer uh, any questions you may have. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Oldham. Uh, board members, any questions? Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Dr. Oldham. Um, I do have a question. You referred to... Um, El Dorado County joining in another um, plan, uh, so to speak, with the with the other counties. Yeah, so they they had applied um, earlier in the year to do kind of something a, a, called a local initiative with uh, the health plan of San Joaquin, another health plan operating in, in uh, San Joaquin County and some, some other counties in the Central Valley region. So this is kind of like a third option, right? Yeah, that, that's not an option that at this point is open to, to Placer uh, or any of the other counties. That was something that uh, back when we did the letter of intent, uh, El Dorado and a few other counties um, opted to uh, try to go for that model uh, with uh, Health Plan of San Joaquin. Is so so the, the model that we discussed potentially, I know um, our, some of our uh, representatives from the plan suggested there might be um, kind of a third way, um, a, a way uh, similar to what ha you know Imperial County has, uh, where there um, the, the, there's uh, two plans uh, operating, and, and one of those uh, potentially uh, could be governed under a regional health authority, uh, and that was what was proposed uh, potentially that Plaster and El Dorado might team up um, and help, help to lead a regional health authority with. Uh, other, you know, smaller uh, county. There's some r rural, small rural counties that are uh, not opting to go to a county organized health system uh, model. And so that that was uh, sort of the, the idea uh, that uh, that that we would, you know, talk about that, and we did. We kind of explored that with with El Dorado, and it sounds like at this point uh, there's really no no appetite to continue those discussions. But uh, again, we'll we'll um, stay open to to those uh, in the event that you know I think it's unlikely. But if uh, for whatever reason uh, the transition to a uh, county organized health system model uh, is 
not, not in the cards uh, for us. The state does not approve that transition or, or something else happens. Uh, we'll uh, continue to look at that model, kind of under the regional model, how can we uh, get more uh, local governance? So if, if we decide to do this today, it goes into effect when? Uh, in 2024. Okay. So what would, if we decide today, basically, we would be taken out of the procurement the state's about to do. Um, and, and so uh, we would actually, you know, we would select a uh, partnership health plan. If we didn't today, then it would go out for bid. Uh, the state will uh, issue a, a, a procurement for, like they did last time, and the state will make the selection of the, um, which health plan. So there's actually no, no assurance that our current health plans, with whom we do have uh, strong working relations, uh, there's no assurance that they'll they'll get the uh, the bid you know for another five to ten years if they were to go out. But I know there was some uh, suggestion that maybe we wait and go you know go for the regional model that there might be uh, for another five years. So that would put us um, until 2029 before we would have an opportunity to to do this again if we were to wait. Um. So are we limited in time to make this decision? Yeah, so that the state has clarified now, but I think the, the last uh, time we discussed this, uh, early October, I believe the, the deadline now, uh, looks like it's uh, October the 10th in order to pass the, the second reading in order to be um, you know, uh, brought into the, co the COES model. I believe eight of the 10 counties have already done so, and I believe Placer and one other county is, uh, has it on the agenda for second reading today. Okay, so, and what's the difference in, in what's available out there between what we have and going with this uh, other option that we're looking at today. What, what's the difference in the services and, and, and what patients are eligible to receive? Yeah, the, the eligibility is similar. So for Medi these are for Medi-Cal, you know, it's the, Medi the federal Medicaid program in California is called Medi-Cal. And mm -hmm. so uh, similar eligibility, um, no matter what the model is, this is really about um, the who manages the care. So um, in 2013, Placer moved into a managed care model. So under all of these models, uh, you have uh, an entity um, who's, who's managing the care. And um, I would say partnership, this is all they do, is uh, Medi-Cal managed care just in Northern California uh, with uh, counties, uh, whereas uh, the other health plans, I think all the ones that likely would be applying if there were another procurement, have lots of different lines of businesses. So Medi-Cal isn't the, the only focus of them and certainly not uh, Northern California. Um, but all, all of them, you know, all these plans are skilled at manage, managing care. I think they might have di somewhat different approaches, but there's a lot of similarities between the two. Um, I think the, the biggest uh, difference here, again, is um, you know, the, uh, I guess it is relevant that partnership is a uh, not-for-profit. Um, and so you know, they um, have been, you know, in, in talking with other counties, do a lot of investment um, in their uh, communities, uh, in, in the counties that they serve and the providers uh, are very happy, seem to be overall very happy with, with partnership. Um, uh, you know, and, and then of course the, the big difference is around uh, the, the local governance as opposed to, uh, you know, the, uh, e even with governance sharing with these other plans, um, you know, again, I'll, uh, it, it's not assured that uh, the, the promises that are made uh, we don't know who, who, will, who would win the procurement. The state would get to select for us. Um, but also, I think most of these uh, 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 other commercial uh, plans have headquarters, you know, out of state or, you know, uh, certainly at a distance from, from us. And so it likely wouldn't be the same type of governance where uh, we would enjoy with, with partnership health plans. I think those are the two main th distinctions. Um, but uh, there, there are a lot of similarities, again. Uh, most of the plans that do this, they're professionals, the staff are, you know, uh, we've, we've worked with them very well on things like uh, whole person care and CalAIM and a lot of the uh, important things that are, uh, that, that we're, uh, challenges that we have uh, ahead of us. Okay, so there were, I think, 10 rural counties that were in the same position as we are using the same, um, I don't know if you call it a provider or the, man, the company that manages the services. Correct. Yes. That we have ten, actually, um, the regional model is a larger number than than ten uh, of, of those who the counties that were put in the regional model. The ten uh, counties have chosen, uh, you know, to, issued a letter of intent to leave the regional model and move to the um, uh, you know the regional model with uh, Anthem and California Health and Wellness are the two plans right now uh, serving uh, the regional model counties. And uh, so those those ten counties have. Um, did, did the letter of intent back in March, 
Um, and uh, like I said, eight, eight of those 10 have uh, already passed the, the second reading of, of the ordinance uh, to uh, make the move to partnership. Right, it makes me wonder why eight out of 10 want to leave the current situation. I think that's <laughs> documented in the audit that was done by the Joint Legislative Audit Committee. In yeah. The bottom paragraph. Yeah. So, so, um, but what I'm getting to then, I know Senator Nielsen had ordered an audit. Have there been major problems with the current company, uh, with Anthem? <laughs> Yeah, again, I, I think the, the most of the, the things that were found in the audit um, were with the model itself. So it wasn't necessarily directed at, uh, you know, Anthem or California Health and Wellness. It's been, you know, the, the problems that the audit found were, one, with the model, and two, actually with the state oversight of the model. Um, and, and so, you know, and that was one of the things, you know, these counties have been talking with each other for a long time about their concerns and wanting to make, uh, you know, have more say uh, locally um, in the in the model, but also you know, in the, the governance of the actual benefit, um, and uh, have not been allowed that opportunity up until now. And you know, this, this conversation I believe started back in 2016. Um, at that point, it was uh, the uh, per, you know it was supposed to be a five-year contract, and the state extended it again without consulting with uh, the counties to, to 10 years. And so, yeah, I, I would say. Um, mostly the, the, uh, what was found in the um, state auditor report and other reports, the California Health and uh, Healthcare Foundation also did a report with similar findings that um, you know, the outcomes, so the quality metrics uh, for um, patients who were served by the regional model uh, was not as good as um, other models such as uh, the county organized health systems, but also access uh, was not as good. So I think it, it was more of an indictment of, of the model as opposed to any individual plan. Okay, and if we don't go, if we don't move forward with this today, then the other will be put out for an RFP, and the current company Anthem that won't necessarily be the winner. That's correct. Yeah, we'll, it'll go out for bid again, and Placer would if we did if we didn't uh, make this move uh, kind of proactively to a county organized health system. This will probably be our last uh, chance to do so. So if we don't don't do it now likely we'll be in the regional model again and uh we'll be including that rfp and um the, the selection will, will be made for us i think it's you know uh, we will uh likely i'm, I'm hearing uh that uh, counties will be given more of a say might have an opportunity to provide letters of, of recommendation and support uh, during that procurement for uh for different health plans so uh it, it, that's uh i guess remains to be seen but i'm hearing uh, that maybe the, this this time the counties will have uh, more of a of a say if we did go that route, but I think the the sure thing uh, would be you know going to a you know uh, county organized health system where we know what we're going what we're getting. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. You had questions? Yeah, thank comments? you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oldham. Um, so you're asking us uh, to authorize the county of Placer to join the partnership health plan of California Commission, and this would allow us to have our county organized health system. Is that correct? That's correct. And would that give us local, more local control over uh, how we move forward with our health care? Yes, I think, I think so. We would have, uh, uh, it's, it, again, not, not exactly, uh, the details aren't worked out as far as what uh, our voice would be, but I think certainly Placer County would have um, a number of uh, votes on the, on the board and would have more control you know, in the governance of, uh, of, that, of uh, that, uh, the health plan for Medi-Cal beneficiaries. So having more local control would uh, uh, help us not to have the state of California dictate uh, a plan for us. Is that correct? That's correct. We're right at home. And if I remember right, uh, Placer County is the second healthiest county in the state. Is it the second or first? I keep forget, forgetting. Yeah, it, it bounces. We bounce around a little bit. Oh. Depends on there's different organizations that do those those uh, those rankings, but we're we're doing pretty well. So if we go ahead with this county organized health system, would that help our rating as far as the second or first healthiest county in the state of California? Yeah, Super Brother Home, certainly it could. Uh, when we look at, again, um, in the uh, com comparison of uh, COE's model, you know, county organized health system model counties versus the regional model, there are uh, a number of quality metrics where um, those uh, counties in those models um, and Medi-Cal beneficiaries within those models um, ha have better quality of care. And so 
having better of quality of care, particularly I would say for Medi-Cal beneficiaries who often um, are, are those who get left behind. Um, you know, I look at things even like vaccination rates, um, other uh, important things where we see real health disparities for Medi-Cal beneficiaries. And so I think if we really want to improve uh, the health status of, of Placer County, a great place to start is actually uh, providing better care to Medi-Cal beneficiaries. So I'm not, not going to say, you know, promise that uh, this change will automatically uh, have, a, have an outcome, but I think it's uh, really important that we have that control given how important it is. You know, Medi-Cal beneficiaries don't have a lot of options, and so um, I think it's, it's critical that uh, they, they, we really, um, uh, ha they have a voice uh, and uh, there are, uh, so there's also patient representation on the board for a partnership health plan, uh, but in that we have really uh, much, much closer uh, control uh, oversight over the quality of care provided to our Medi-Cal beneficiaries. All righty. Thank you very much. I don't know why we wouldn't do this. Any other questions? I'll, I'll wait until after we hear from you. Okay. Uh, my only uh, question, Dr. Oldham, was um, I know that that you work closely and your department works closely with the current system um, and I'm encouraged that the state is now hearing as we've thought about breaking away to have more local control the state is saying that maybe they would consider different options that would give us more local control uh, in response but to date they have not and that's what the audit showed and that is why these other counties and ourselves are considering going this different route where we would have more local control is that correct that is correct thank you okay any public comment on this item we have two on zoom and we have two on zoom anybody here in the audience okay why don't you come up you've been waiting patiently all morning good morning my name is Christy Ward and I'm I have a child in the district of Placer County anyhow I'm speaking on I think we should definitely keep local control I don't have much to say on this exact matter, but I think it's very important for us to keep local control because government is trying to overreach and mess up our constitution. We really need to stay local control, and I appreciate that you guys have done that. Thankful. Thank you. Okay, and then we have Zoom callers. <clears throat> Jason, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. This is for uh, Dr. Odom. This is Jason Wedge. So you mentioned this is a, uh, it's a not-for-profit county health care system that gives us more local control. Would this give the uh, providers an opportunity to offer um, alternative medicines that currently is uh, deemed unsafe or, um, or, uh, or by the state doesn't uh, allow, you know, such as you know, some of the medicines for, you know, iver ivermectin and hydrochloroquine. Would this give more local control for the county to uh, dictate whether they choose to uh, use these methods of treatments or not? Jason, do you have other comments or questions? And I'm going to get through all the public comments. That's, that's all I have for Dr. Oldham. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next caller. Mike, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Yeah. Yes, thank you. My name is uh, Mike Prozio with Anthem Blue Cross, uh, regional vice president, also a, a constituent, a resident of Placer County. Uh, not surprisingly, we would ask you to delay this or reject this. Um, I wanted to a, thank Dr. Oldham as well as all of you. Um, there has been more discussion in Placer County than in other counties on this issue. Uh, we still don't think an adequate level of transparency into the process, but we do applaud Placer for um, doing more than other counties have. Um, a few things that were mentioned, um, Dr. Oldham mentioned access. Um, moving to partnership won't provide more access for Medicaid patients. Um, there are challenges in any rural setting around access. The aforementioned audit focused on some issues largely in the far north of California, near Susanville or uh, Inyo and Mono, those counties, um, not to say we don't have access challenges in Placer, but <clears throat> Anthem already has a robust network, long-term contracts in place with UC Davis, Sutter, Dignity to provide services. Um, so we would challenge and ask the proponents of a move to a COS to identify exactly what additional access they would be providing there. Um, we also think the board should consider the financial impacts of this. I think Dr. Oldham said you're still waiting on the financial details of this. 
Currently, in the current model, you hold no financial risk for the Medi-Cal system. That risk is held by Anthem and our competitor plan, California Health and Wellness. When you move to a COS, you do hold some financial risk. Clearly, that has not been clearly outlined yet, and we don't have all those details, but we're moving forward anyways. For the purposes of local control, if you truly want local control, you will not join up with what will ultimately be a 25-county plan in which partnership to the earlier point about you know eight of the 10 counties it's 18 counties currently in the rural system uh, partnership has cherry picked um, a handful of the 10 counties they want in because they're the least challenging counties they didn't ask inyo to join they didn't ask other more challenging counties to join because partnership recognizes the difficulties of doing that so many counties are staying in the regional but if you want local control, the partnership board has representatives of at least one or two representatives of all 25 counties. So Placer will have one or two, maybe you'll get three representatives on a 30 to 40 member board. A local initiative, which has been talked about, was an option, but it was never put forward by any of the proponents in all of these rural counties, because as Dr. Oldham said, quote, we've been waiting for the opportunity to move to a COS. So there was never a transparency to the boards of all of these counties of what your options were eight months ago. We could have had conversations about a local initiative in which you would create a Placer County Medicaid department, Medicaid agency in which you would have absolute control in a local initiative. But that was not never an option that was put forward in Placer or Butte because I think Dr. Oldham's predecessor and others have been working on this for some time to move away from a competitive marketplace run by private plans to a government run marketplace in the Medicaid system. That's what this is about. This is about eliminating competition, eliminating choice for Medicaid members. Right now, Medicaid members in Placer County get a choice. You're taking away their choice. They would be the only market segment not given some choice of health plans. Businesses get to choose. Covered California gets to choose. Medicaid currently gets to choose, but you would be eliminating choice for that. You would be saying that we, the government knows better what, how you can pick your Medicaid services. The government knows better than the individual. We think choice should be maintained. We think the LI is an option. As Dr. Oldham said, you know, maybe we have to go through one more procurement or the state has also said, while they do have an October 10th deadline, they would be willing on a case by case basis to consider pushing that deadline out or listening to appeals from counties beyond that, that deadline. So we think this is a decision that's being made with only portions of the information. It's not giving you the local control you want. And instead, it's really much more focused on an agenda to move private sector health plans out of the system in favor of uh, government run plans. And we think long term, that's not in the best interest of the county or, or the state. So we would ask you to reject the proposal or at least postpone action until we can get further clarification from the state as to options. Thanks. Chair, we have one more now. Michael, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Yeah, I agree. There's There just isn't enough information. Um, uh, I, I really couldn't follow um, Dr. Oldham's presentation. I really didn't understand what, what we're currently under, what's the benefit of this, what, what other options do we have? And the last caller, I believe his name was Mike, presented a lot more details that we clearly don't have the information that we need to make this decision. Thank you. No more public comment. Okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Oldham, did you want to address any of the questions or comments? Uh, yeah, uh, Mike, and I don't think I've met Mike before, so glad to hear he's a Placer resident. Um, but, you know, talk, talk more with other staff uh, from Anthem over, over the years, uh, but brought up a number of uh, points, and I, I won't respond to all of them, um, but around the, the financial risk, which I think is an important one and sort of alluded to previously, but I think uh, brought up more directly. Um, we've uh, asked around, at least, at least the, the folks who are advising us, and so uh, tell us that there, there really is no financial risk uh, to counties under um, a county uh, organized health system uh, model, as, as was described uh, before. So uh, that, that's probably the most important thing and, and was compelling when that was brought up uh, at, the, at the first reading. And so uh, we've asked around, and it, that doesn't actually seem to be 
the case. Um, and so, but you know, some of the others around choice, I think we've addressed that before. Um, that really, you know, right now, um, it's not like Medi-Cal beneficiaries really have a, a, a choice. Mo most of the choice is around providers, and so having access uh, to, especially specialty providers, we've had. Uh, beneficiaries having to travel really long distances for even common specialty, uh, you know, care like uh, obstetrics, gynecology, uh, dermatology, et cetera. So, um, uh, yeah, there, there are no guarantees, but definitely we'll hear from other very rural partnership uh, counties where uh, access can be a real challenge, but the partnership has done an excellent job in trying to uh, create as much choice as possible for, for beneficiaries. They're, even in those environments, and I think they're really excited about uh, Placer County um, because we do have uh, more providers, many of them that are not contracted with Medi-Cal right now. Some of our largest providers don't have uh, contracts, especially for spe uh, primary care. Um, in, in Placer County uh, with Medi-Cal, with our Medi-Cal plans uh, right right now. And so I think uh, partnership, uh, they're, they're, again, make, uh, acknowledge that we make this uh, decision with that, without the full amount of information. It's early on the process, um, uh, but uh, right now the, what we're hearing from other partnership counties is they're actually very satisfied uh, with the, the access um, uh, with, with uh, partnership health plan. Certainly the um, financial risk uh, I don't think is, is there um, and, and we, can, we can get more information on that uh, from uh, partnership health plan. Again, they're gonna be providing their financials to the state, I believe in the next couple of months that that report is, is due. But other than that, I don't, I don't think that there are uh, other, other, unless you have uh, additional questions. Um, I think that's I think the only other uh, most of the points I wanted to hit. I think the only other question was on uh, the uh, alternative medications. Would it provide more flexibility on those for COVID? And I think. Um, yeah, probably not. I'll say, I mean, the, the Medi-Cal benefit is the same. And so again, it's back to uh, these plans have different ways of uh, managing that benefit. But uh, yeah, there, as far as what's covered and what's not covered, for the most part, it's, uh, it's similar across, uh, across different plans. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. I do have one question. Okay. Um, Dr. Oldham, uh, Partnership Health, do they have contracts with Sacramento County health providers? I know they have contracts with Placer County health providers, but what about Sacramento County for referrals for specialty care? Yeah, I, um, I think it depends. Certainly, some of them, um, I, and I know you know the large uh, health systems because you know, uh, partnership operates in Yolo County. So I know they have uh, contracts with many of the large you know uh, large health systems that operate in both Placer and Yolo. Um, but um, you know they they're they're not contracted. Partnership doesn't operate in in Sacramento County, but. Um, and, and again, I think that generally they try to find uh, specialty care and primary care actually in the county uh, or in the counties that they serve as opposed to sending beneficiaries uh, down the hill to, to Sacramento. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll, we can check on that to see if they, to what extent they have uh, uh, contracts with um, for providers in, in Sacramento County. Thank you. Um, there are specialists, uh, primarily um, pulmonary, um, heart, cardiac, uh, excuse me, cardiac care in Sacramento County where um, a lot of patients go to. So I think that's important. Um, I wanna have a conversation. This, this has been really, I've had a lot of conversations with Partnership Health, with California Health and Wellness, uh, with Anthem. I've really appreciated the conversations that we've had. And this is, this is actually a really challenging decision. And uh, it's too bad all these folks aren't here because we've been talking about other issues, but I, this has been weighing on my mind for the last probably two weeks as I've been having all these conversations with our current providers, with our staff about how do we provide our residents uh, the best care that they can get under the Medi-Cal system. Um, and I really appreciate the work that our current partners have done. It's, it's not easy to get specialty care uh, right now, especially mental health care for, for our, our communities. Um, and as I've been interacting with staff, it's like I, I've asked a lot of questions. So I know folks are watching, um, Mr. Prozio and others, I've asked a lot of questions about partnership health I asked a lot of questions um, with our staff and was even open to this additional regional model with El Dorado County. They're now out of the option even to have a further conversation. Um, and, and I think it's just really important that they hear, uh, we just wanna make sure we've got 
really good care for our residents. Um, it's frustrating to me that the state of California is telling us what we can and can't do with providing the care for our residents. That's very frustrating. Um, and I appreciate the state finally did hear that there were counties that had concerns about how the, the model plan was working um, and has given us the option to, to make a change. Um, I, wanna, I wanna move forward with this, but I, I do think that even in light of the El Dorado County decision, we, we might need to be aware that partnership health may not end up being our option from the state of California. Uh, I wanna make sure we're continuing to work with our current partners because they are still our current partners for the next couple of years providing care for our residents. And I think in the last uh, couple of years, they've worked hard to step up to the plate to do that. Um, but I do, you know, I'm open to further conversations especially in sort of a second track in case this plan doesn't go forward with the state of California, which a little bit of me is concerned that it may not happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think we need to move forward, uh, but I do want to let the other providers know how much I appreciate the work that they've done um, and appreciate the conversations um, that we've had. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. Our, is there a motion? <laughs> is there a second? Thank you, Suzanne. Okay, this is uh, an ordinance authorizing the county to join Partnership Health Plan of California Commission. So with that, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No. So we'll move on. Thank you very much for the great dialogue on that item. The, and I agree with Bonnie. We've had a number of briefings from staff and many um, conversations. So well informed and very confusing items to deal with. <laughs> so Jamie Wright is here. Um, thank you for being patient with us today, Jamie Placer, Commuter Express. Um, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, today I am before you asking um, for the uh, asking uh, for the board's um, action to authorize the Director of Public Works or designee to execute Amendment Number Two. Uh, to our contract 000976 with MV Transportation Inc. to provide operations for Placer Commuter Express for an additional one year in the amount not to exceed $434,528 for the period of November 1st, 2021 through October 31st, 2022. Um, on October 3rd, 2017, your board did award uh, contra the contract with MV Transportation to provide uh, commuter um, drivers for our commuter service um, down into Sacramento. Um, last year, I came before your board and asked for amendment number one um, for our first one year extension to be approved. Uh, we did do that, and I am before you today asking for the second one year extension to be approved. Um, this is our final year of this contract, so we will be going out um, to RFP. This is our commuter service, um, so uh, due to COVID um, and the reduction of many workers working uh, in their offices down in Sacramento, we have reduced service over the last year and a half. We expect that reduction to continue. Uh, we're hearing mixed things uh, about when people are going back to work. Um, so we will continue to kind of monitor uh, the need and provide service based on need uh, for those commuting into Sacramento. Um, the pricing um, for this one year extension is a 3.1 increase, which is in line and was approved as part of the initial con the original contract in October of 2017. And with that, I'll take any questions you have. Thank you, Jamie. Any questions, board members? Not seeing any. Do we have any public comment on this item? Nobody on Zoom either. So with that, I'll entertain a motion. Move approval. I'll second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, guys. Opposed. <laughs> okay. 
And our final open session item today, item number nine, this is an urgency ordinance on the River Fire Debris Removal Program. Dave. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dave Atkinson, Assistant Director of Emergency Services. Closing out your open session items today with an urgency ordinance as part of a River Fire uh, next step in our recovery. Uh, as you recall from our previous conversations, about 50 homes were destroyed in Placer County uh, from the River Fire. Uh, as part of our efforts in moving forward with that, a local uh, uh, health emergency was declared and uh, that uh, allowed us then to provide or to request from the state some additional assistance in our cleanup efforts. Uh, the first phase of that is called household hazardous waste removal and actually I'm pleased to report that, that work took about a week and is already done. So the urgency ordinance before you today is the phase two of our debris removal program that the state puts together for us and that consists essentially of, of two options for folks. Option one, they can opt in to the state-run program at no cost to themselves. Essentially, they complete a right of entry and then they allow the state to come in with their contractors to do to the debris removal as well as remove any contaminated soils, do soils testing, and then essentially turn the site back over to the property owner ready to go uh, for rebuilding as they choose. Second option for those who choose not to go with the state plan, uh, have an option to hire their own contractor at their own expense, still comply with the same level of service as would be done under the state. So the soils testing, all of that would have to be done to the same level and they would have to pre prepare a work plan that would have to be submitted to environmental health for review and approval before they start. So essentially the urgency ordinance before you today uh, essentially puts the framework together for that program and allows us to move forward with requesting that service from the state. Uh, as uh, we all know, it rained last night, thankfully, but that also puts a fine point on the fact that there is some urgency to get this debris removal done as we want to make sure that that uh, gets cleaned up to the best as it can before the rains really start this winter. And so that's the reason that this is an urgency ordinance this morning. And if I'm correct, we need a four-fifths vote for an urgency ordinance. That's and uh, in terms of financial costs, uh, staff is prepared to continue to do this work under the existing budget uh, for environmental health. I am pleased to report that we got word on this weekend that the federal major disaster declaration has now been expanded to also include debris removal, which means that the county's cost share is going to be significantly reduced. I believe we're going from 25% to 6.25%, so considerable um, reduction in the county's share. Uh, I have uh, Jason Felipe with me from Environmental Health, and we're both here to answer any questions your board may have. Thank you very much, Dave. Are there any questions? I'm not seeing any. Any public comment on this item? And as you mentioned, it is an urgency ordinance. We need a unanimous vote of the four of us here today, so I'll entertain a motion. Second. And then we'll do a roll call vote. Gore? Holmes, Aye. Jones, Aye. Gustafson. Aye. Appreciate the board thank, support. Thank you for all the support for these folks out there. They've gone through a lot. Okay, we're ready to go into closed session. Karen, take it away. The board will now, um, the board will now adjourn to closed session. Under our closed session agenda, under existing litigation in number 1A, County of Placer versus GNS Carpets Mills, this will be dropped from closed session. To be heard on closed session on their existing litigation will be in Ray Garland Liu, and we have two items under anticipated litigation, two potential cases to discuss. Okay, we're back from closed session. Karen, will you give the report? The board met in closed session to consider one item of existing litigation. In Ray Garland Liu, the board heard a report and authorized settlement. On the first potential case of anticipated litigation, the board heard a report and provided direction. On the second potential case, the board heard a report and provided direction. This concludes the report out of closed session. Thank you, and we stand adjourned. <laughs>